Good morning. Welcome to the Mean Stock MBA. Uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, so, me and Helen, we have a. I'm Helen. I'm Stephen. I'm not Helen. I'm Stephen. <laughs> this is Helen, and、um, we're going to talk about the Mean Stack, which is a really cool set of technologies that work together pretty nicely.、Um, it's all written in JavaScript.、Uh, mean is an acronym for MongoDB, Express, Node.js, and Helen. What am I missing? Angular. Angular. Yes, <laughs> but not necessarily in that order.、Um, What we'll be doing is we'll be creating a Twitter clone application called Chirp, and what we can do is we can create tweets or not tweets but cheeps, excuse me, and、um, we'll be creating this application from the front to the back,、um, building off of our previous、uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy videos on Angular JS,、uh, Express JS, as well as MongoDB, and this kind of ties everything together into one cohesive application. That you can use as a framework of your understanding of the mean stack, and go off and make your own mean stack applications, so that you can divide and conquer.、Uh, anything else, Helen?、Uh, no. Let's start in some, with some intros. So my name is Helen Zhang, and I'm a developer evangelist for San Francisco, and I. In specific,、uh, specifically, I work with startups in San Francisco out of the top incubators and accelerators to drive adoption on Azure and to help them create apps for our platforms. So, I, in my spare time, I also give quite a few talks to developer audiences, and I am a huge web development nerd. So, I play around frameworks like this all the time.、Uh, I'm also a volunteer computer science teacher at Mission High School in San Francisco, and I'm a pretty avid traveler. My personal site is below. Just a little plug. Stephen. Hey guys. So、uh, my name is Stephen. Helen's actually my counterpart in San Francisco.、Uh, I also work with、um, some of the, the accelerators down in San Francisco. A couple of them, like YC or Startex.、Um, and what we'll do is we'll、uh, we create、um, integrations for between open source technologies and Azure to kind of ease those gaps and、um, help onboard startups to on Azure. I'm a JavaScript junkie. I run Azure.、Um, I connect to Azure basically from anything. I've connected from microcontrollers, as well as、um, Windows phones, Androids, iPhones,、um, and I love just creating JavaScript experiences on each of those platforms. And what's really cool is that JS runs everywhere, and I'm super into that. So now,、um, uh, actually, on the bottom of my side as well, I think I did do a shameless plug as well.、Um, so if you want to know more about me, you could definitely hit up my website.、Um, and I guess we can move on. So. Yeah. So let's go over what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with in this module talking about the mean stack, going over each specific component, what it's going to do in our application, and we're actually going to show you our demo application as well, walk you around that.、Uh, in the next module, I'm going to go over Angular JS, some basic concepts in Angular, and start creating our app locally. And then Stephen's going to build out the backend using Node and Express. Um, he's going to build out the APIs that we're going to hit using our Angular app eventually, and then in the fourth module, he's going to integrate MongoDB for our data source. Then module five, you'll come back to me. I'm going to tie everything together, go and you know actually call the APIs that Stevens created and show that application working live. And then we're going to deploy all of this to Azure and show you some more resources in the Meanstack community, some other. Generators or things that you can use, testing frameworks, and conclude from there. Oh,、so, uh, what can they? Oh, okay, great. I was going to ask what can our users expect to know、um, <laughs> beforehand, but I、uh, Helen beat me to it.、Uh, so, what what can our users expect to have to know、um, in order to you know be very productive in this Microsoft Virtual Academy? So, because everything we're going to do is JavaScript,、uh, we expect you to have a pretty good. Grasp of JavaScript, as well as some basic web development concepts,、uh, such as you know what an MVC framework is going to be. We're going to still go over quite a few of these things, but it'll help if you have that good foundation. So again, it'll be great if you have a strong grasp of JavaScript, if you're familiar with HTML, CSS, and with、uh, Bootstrap or Twitter Bootstrap rather,、uh, which is just a great library for 
making a beautiful front end. And if you want to look at other resources that might help, there's an introduction to AngularJS MVA. There is the very awesome You've Got Documents MongoDB Jumpstart that Steven was actually part of. And, there's, <laughs> and it's not listed here, but there's actually a Node.js MVA as well. Okay. If you want to call them out. Yeah, Stacy Mulcahy and Rami did that one. Stacy also worked on the Angular MBA along with Christopher. So, <laughs> Christopher's waiting for the back for those of you who can't see. <laughs> so, if you want to join the MBA community, uh, please do. There's a lot of really great online learnings like what we just talked about. There's over 2 million registered users, and there's a lot of really great relevant training, even on open source technologies like the Mean Stack. So let's really get into it. What is the mean stack? Let's actually show a demo of our mean stack application. And I'm going to apologize in advance because this is not the exact version that we're going to show in the end, but it's pretty darn close. So as you can see, there's an application we've built here called Chirp. Uh, We've lightly styled it using Twitter Bootstrap with a very typical navigation header you might have seen. We're going to implement a login and registration system and people will be able to post into the stream. We've disabled the guest posting for now because, let's be honest, we don't know what all you are going to say. Um, but you'll see us posting into the stream later on. And by the end, once you actually authenticate, you'll be able to post into the stream as well. I think our users should be able to um, register already, right? I'm pretty sure. Uh, you're revealing our secrets. I think it's actually not working right now because I tried right before this. Oh, and it didn't work? Yeah, okay, sorry. That's cool. Sorry to reveal it's some probably of that. better. It's probably it's better anyways. Yeah, yeah <laughs> honestly, you have a chat, okay? Go to the MBA Q&A chat if you want to say anything to us. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, let's talk about why we're actually going to use the meme stack. Well, as we said before, the mean stack is all built using JavaScript. Uh, as a lot of people say, it's really one language to rule them all. Because you can build your server in JavaScript. You can, of course, uh, build out your front end in JavaScript. And Angular even pr provides a nice framework for you to build out that nice MVC in the front end as well. Everything that we're going to use is completely open source. While they might be supported by larger corporations, such as uh, MongoDB or uh, Joyent or Google, everything that they're making is open source and you can go through and access all of that. Node.js also has a huge module library if you want to go and take components that you might need. For example, for authentication, we're actually going to use a module that other people have built on top of that. And it's really easy to get started quickly with the mean stack because, as you can see, we're going to build out a complete application in just a few hours because since the front end and the back end is all using one language, it's extremely cohesive. Everything we're using is extremely lightweight um, and it's not too much of a burden to run. That's probably why it's pretty popular with uh, um, web developers, right? I'm, I'm imagining because the whole thing's written in JavaScript. So if you're just familiar with uh, really good with JavaScript on the front end, you can make your way back through the back end and even through the database because even the database is really JavaScript-like. Um, so really, it's actually quite friendly for um, if you're just really familiar with front-end development and you kind of want to get into the back end a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually primarily a front-end developer, but you know the means that came along, Node.js especially, was so helpful because I said, uh, you know, this. I don't want to necessarily build something monolithic with Apache or anything huge, but hey, if I can start up a server in 10 lines or less, it must not be that intimidating. It ain't that bad. Yeah, so, <laughs> so now I can kind of call myself a full stack JavaScript developer, and it's pretty great. So let's actually talk about some, all the components that go into the mean stack. As I said before, AngularJS is the A in the mean stack, and it's going to take care of our application's entire front end. It's a client-side MVC framework. Um, so we're going to build out models uh, to communicate to our, our views, which is the HTML that you're going to see, basically. And we're also going to have uh, separate out our application logic inside controllers. And this is similar to what you might do you know, in the back end as well, only you're doing this strictly in the front end. So you're actually creating really good delineation between your code, and it keeps things very, very clean. AngularJS is open source, although it's maintained by Google. Google has dedicated a lot of really great engineers to work on AngularJS, and 
the, the driving force behind Angular is they're saying, you know, what would HTML look like if HTML was designed to be for building web apps instead of for building, you know, documents or hypertext? Yeah. Uh, I mean, before Angular, most people, I guess, were just using jQuery, right? And um, really just manipulating the DOM itself. And I guess Angular is really cool because it's kind of written as for the future of H HTML in the case where you can just directly put in the HTML what you want to data bind. And data binding really is just the concept of binding your data to your UI so that you don't have to explicitly say, hey, add this div, add this div, or add this thing, or change this value like you would do in jQuery. Instead, you just simply change data and magically the you know, the UI changes, and actually the vice versa works as well. So it makes it quite nice. Yeah, and not to get into this too deeply, but Angular actually injects some, or makes available some attributes that you can put directly into your HTML to be able to start changing things around. So when you look at some Angular code, you'll, it'll actually look quite a lot like uh, just a really nicely formatted, really responsive HTML document, as opposed to you know some HTML here, and then a lot of the logic is actually obfuscated in some JavaScript function in another file. So when you're looking at an Angular uh, document, you'll actually be able to see, oh, you know, this is where certain logic goes, and it's really clean. And Angular GIS is also really, really easy to test. Um, it's built with you know test-driven development in mind. We're not going to use too much testing today just for the sake of time, but it's com it comes bundled with, a, what is it called? Protractor. Protractor. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's built, um, or it's bundled with Protractor, and the Angular documentation does a really, really good job of saying, how, sh how can you build unit tests for everything that you're doing? And how do you uh, do a complete end to end test for your entire application? So, uh, where can you get Angular? How do you install it? It's really, really easy. You can just go to the AngularJS uh, docs here. Whoops. I am going to click into this link. And you can actually install it straight from the Google CDN, which is what we're going to do. So you can get the minimified files straight uh, from Google just by linking to it, like so. And So this pulls right off of the CDN. So we don't actually have to worry about um, maybe even like storing the file or serving it out itself, right? It just comes right off of that? Yeah, exactly. And if you haven't used the CDN before, it's really great because uh, once multiple websites and multiple people are hitting that same link, it'll, it'll be cached and it'll be much quicker for your users to access instead of, you know, your users pulling in down pulling the Angular file down from your server, you know, another side, they're pulling down exactly the same file. So it's just nice to have that be stored. Some better performance there. Yeah, right. exactly. Yep. We're going to start out using the, the just the straight Angular library. Uh, but later on, we're actually going to incorporate some additional modules that aren't included in the basic package, so to speak. Uh, we're going to be using some routing and some resources. So we'll be getting to those files as we need them. So next, uh, let's talk about Node.js. Node is the lightweight web server that we're going to use, and it's built in Google's V8 JavaScript engine, um, which is a rendering engine for Chrome. It's extremely lightweight and efficient, and as you can see here, uh, these are all the lines that it would take to just start running a server. I'm not going to do this right now because Stephen's going to demo this later on his module, and I don't want to steal his thunder. But as you can see, it's extremely simple. You're, you just require the modules that you need, and you create a server. You just say, hey, create a server, run it on this port, um, listen on this port, and this is what you'll send as the response to your clients. And as you can see, it's just sending hello world. It's extremely simple. Super easy. Yeah. yeah. And you'll install Node.js by actually going to the Node.js website and clicking download. Obviously, a bit more difficult than you know just linking to a file from Angular. Uh, but you can actually download the pretty easy Windows installers here, and you can also download the binaries if you care to look at them. As it notes here, if you want to build from source, you'll need you know Python 2.6 or 2.7. Yep. But I just recommend getting the installer for today if you don't have it already. Yeah, most uh, most of us are actually supported um, just right out of the box. They have binaries for um, you could just and especially if you're using Ubuntu, if you're using CentOS, 
uh, Debian-based systems and Fedora-based systems, they have um, they have package managers which will just pull the version for you, and you can just do like apt install to install the um, the version of Node that you want, and it'll just get going. Um, if you are using um, a Debian uh, system like Ubuntu or something, uh, do note that the module will be called Node.js and not Node, like we'll be using on Windows. So just the FYI. Awesome. And next, let's talk about Express. Now, Express and Node.js are kind of linked almost completely and tightly. Uh, and that's because it's actually a Node module. We're going to get into exactly what modules mean for Node. But basically, Express is a really, really thin layer on top of Node that makes it much easier to interact with. So whereas you saw in our code before, we have to you know, manually talk about what we're going to send as the headers uh, and things like that. In Express, a lot of that will be sort of magicked away for you um, and abstracted away so that your calls are just so much more simple. This is especially true if you're making a lot of HTTP requests like we're going to do. We're also going to, of course, uh, build out an API using Express because that's all, what we're going to use for all of our routing needs. So it's going to be a, a web API? Yes. OK, cool. Um, and we're going to you know, layer our authentication piece on top of uh, Express in large cases as well. Express also helps you organize your Node app into a easy and cohesive M MVC structure. So your routes will be in one place, your views will be in another place, your logic uh, will be elsewhere. And that just, again, organizes your code so it's a lot easier than you know, having one monolithic JavaScript file for your server, for instance. So you'll install Express, um, as I said before, once you've installed Node. Uh, we're going to get into NPM later on, but that's basically the module library that comes uh, with Node that you could, you know, the Node package manager that you can actually install these modules from. So it's similar to like pip for Python or um, I guess gems uh, for gems yeah. for Ruby or NuGet for .NET. Um, it's just a package manager which allows you to. Um, not necessarily source control your packages, and we'll talk about this more. Um, and instead, you can just keep a manifest, and it'll just install them uh, whenever you need them. Yeah. And as you can see here, once you have Node installed, it's pretty easy. You just call the package manager, and you say, hey, I want to install Express. And next, MongoDB. So this is what we're going to use for our data store. And it's a top NoSQL database base out there. Um, pretty much everyone's using or talking about MongoDB. And that's because, yeah, it's really, really great and it's really, really easy to use. Did you hear about um, MongoDB? Um, I guess they just announced about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, MongoDB 3, uh, which is apparently like something crazy, like 95% faster or something like that. Um, so it's actually pretty exciting uh, that uh, they've done a couple other changes too. Um, something more de more detailed features that you um, that we could talk about later, but um, apparently that just came out, so it's pretty exciting. Oh, that is exciting. Mongo's already really really fast, and it's known for being extremely performant. Um, but you know, faster is always better, right? Yep. Um, Angular is also, by the way, coming out with a new version soon in Angular 2.0 that is going to solve a lot of the problems that people have found with Angular. Not that many. We still like Angular, but you know, there's always room for improvement. <laughs> so uh, Mongo has really JSON-like syntax, which makes it, again, really easy to use if the rest of your stack is already in JavaScript. Um, and it's maintained by uh, the MongoDB company. They, they used to be called TenGen, and they and they changed the names, yeah. Yeah, they changed their name because, hey, if this is a product that you're known for the most, why not just name yourself that? Mm -hmm. um, and it's primarily using just basic key value stores. So you'll download Mongo by going to mongodb.org and just going to downloads again. And it'll take you here. And then we'll, we can see that we have um, installers binaries for um, most most systems, and you can also build right from source, uh, similar to um, similar to Node. So yeah. it's pretty nice. Um, this is not the Mongo three that we talked about. This is, as you can see, this still is still two six seven. Yeah. yeah. Just so you guys don't get confused. Um, and anything you want to add? Anything you want to prep our um, viewers for? No. Uh, so. Uh, I guess the cool thing is, is maybe the why of MeanStack as well. It's not only because it's JavaScript, but it's also quite um, flexible and scalable. So a few of the things that are really nice is that 
Uh, MongoDB doesn't actually um, enforce like actual schemas, so we can be agile. It could change things as your business needs change. Um, Angular is really good because it's a single page application, so it's really responsive. So you don't really have to wait for pages to flip or things like that. Um, and Node.js is actually quite scalable. It's a single threaded application, but it's really good about um, handling asynchronous calls and managing a lot of different tasks at once, which really creates a high level throughput um, for uh, especially IO intensive ta tasks, such as a web server, which might have thousands of requests a day, and it can serve the, all those really quickly. So not only is, uh, is it all JavaScript based, it's actually quite performant, and um, it's something that you should take a look into as a more modern um, application stack that you might be interested in migrating over to. Um, I think that's about it for our module five section, or module one, one section. section. Wow, I am way early. <laughs> Um, it's still the morning here in Seattle, so uh, as you know, I know there's a lot of viewers around the world. Um, so we're just getting our day started. Um, so uh, with that, I guess we can um, we can go ahead and call this module module completed. We've um, we've kind of brought in the fundamentals of the main stack. Uh, we showed you the application that we're going to build, and um, in the next module. We're going to start building right from scratch. We're going to start from an empty folder, build out the complete, you know, a well, not the complete Angular side, but an Angular side that doesn't need a back end and just go straight from there. Every module that uh, we're going to create will pick right off of where the last ones um, ended. Yeah, and all these are hosted on our um, GitHub repository, uh, which is, Christopher said, Microsoft. It's uh, GitHub.com. Yeah. Whack Microsoft Learning Whack Chirp. Yeah, so I pulled it up, up here. Um, so if you want to go to my screen real quick, it's github.com slash Microsoft Learning slash Chirp. Uh, we're going to actually go over uh, each section um, in order, and each section is going to have their own readme's, which will take you through the code that we're going to go through. So you could take a look at that if you want to right now, but uh, we're going to come back and get started with module two. And we're back. This module, so we're on module two actually, and this module is on AngularJS, which will be the MVC framework, model view controller framework for our front end of the Chirp application where we can write our, treat, our cheats and um, be merry and jolly and be social. Um, what, Helen's going to take us through the basic concepts of um, directives, data binding, using uh, Bootstrap to make things a little pretty, and really build out our front end. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of mimic the data and not connect it to the back end. And afterwards, I'll take that over, and we'll actually start linking things together there. Yeah. So today, we're actually going to start by talking about what is a front end framework. Uh, we keep talking about how Angular is one. We keep talking about front end frameworks and what they are, but you know, how do they work? What are some other ones, and what are their advantages? And then we're actually going to go into directives, which is essentially how you insert Angular code into your HTML document. We're going to go over modules, which are essentially the application containers for any app, Angular app, controllers, which is how you're going, to, where you're going to put your application logic for your Angular uh, app, as well as the models and data bindings, which is how we're going to actually display to our users our data and you know, what we're getting from the back end, presumably. And then we're going to go into routing, which is, um, which is interesting because routing is you know, in, typically something that we do in the back end. We're saying, hey, hit this endpoint or hit this endpoint or go to this page. But you can actually do that from just within a single page application uh, through using Angular routing. And we're going to show you a bit of that as well. What is a single page app? So a single page application is, um, you know, I think one of the canonical things that people talk about when they talk about single page applications is actually uh, Gmail, right? Because it's an application that, or it's an application that you'll look at, and it has a lot of different features. You're going to go into a lot of different pages, but actually, when you're clicking into different links and doing different things, even though the URL changes, you're not making a full request to the server for loading a completely new page. You're only loading, you know, parts of the page. So you're. Essentially, even though you're navigating through different elements on the page and going to doing different things, you're actually 
all doing it within one single page. Whoa, mind blown. Single page application. So you're telling me that we actually never change pages. We just, it's a, it's a big trick. It is, it is a big trick because you can see the URL changes. You can actually even go to the different URLs and it'll bring you to that exact part of the single page application. But I mean, the advantage is that since you're using that, you're only loading exactly what you need. So you don't need to load your resources twice if you're you know, calling the same JavaScript file, for instance. So it's a bit snappier. Yeah, definitely. So let's go in and talk about front-end frameworks and what they are. A lot of these front-end frameworks build the single page applications that we just talked about. So a framework is uh, something that will actually you know, structure out your application, uh, such as Angular, whereas there are libraries like jQuery um, that have a lot of you know, useful functions that, that make JavaScript a little bit easier to manipulate, to give you a lot of helper functions, and basically make your JavaScript interactions less painful. They might even, you know, like jQuery, come with a lot of add-ins that will allow you to do cool transitions or um, you know, decent effects. And they'll also allow you to, for instance, you know, make uh, HTTP requests or XHR requests more easily. But AngularJS um, and other MVC frameworks will do that plus a lot more. So whereas jQuery, for instance, doesn't really care about how you like, structure out your application so, as, so long as you include your jQuery um, application in, Angular it will actually say, hey, you know, put all your logic specifically here um, in your views or in your HTML templates that you're using to the page, you know, put in where the code actually go, uh, sorry, um, put in, you know, what elements actually belong here. And you're, you know, really separating out a lot of logic. So AngularJS and other MVC frameworks are a lot more imp opinionated in that way. That's what I was about to say. Opinionated yeah. is kind of like what it, what it seems to be, whereas jQuery is really unopinionated. Yeah. So it's uh, so Angular is an MVC front end framework, much like a lot of other ones such as uh, Backbone or Ember, yep. and there are quite a few popular JavaScript MVC front end frameworks. Sorry, that is a mouthful out there. Uh, Angular is something that is probably more opinionated than the rest because they really want to structure out, like we said before, how HTML apps would look or how HTML would be if HTML was written to build web apps. So with that comes a, a lot of things. So why use Angular in particular? Well, as we said before, it keeps your code really, really organized and structured. You're going to probably put all your controllers in one place, and you will specify that, hey, these are the things that are specifically modifying um, the data before we're pushing it out to for views, users to view. There's, actu there's also two-way data binding, which is something that I think we touched lightly on before. But what that basically is saying is that if you change around your data and apply some logic to it, for instance, in your controller, it's automatically going to change um, and you know, appear differently in your front end when you're looking at that, because that data is bound between the application's view and the application's logic and control. So if I have like a list of cheaps, um, and so we add a new cheap, into the list, it'll just automatically show up in the UI? Yeah, absolutely. And we're actually going to go into a short demo about this. Uh, in a little bit. We already. <laughs> <laughs> in one second, after this next slide. <laughs> yeah, um, this, this slide basically goes over the other frameworks that are out there. Uh, React actually calls itself technically a, a library. Yeah, I think they just call itself the view. The, the V. Era. Yeah, they call themselves the V in yeah. the in MVC, uh, but I threw it in here because it, you know, it's really up and coming. It's really really cool. It's much more performant than the other frameworks out there, specifically because it only tries to do one thing and it tries to do that one thing well. Um, Ember tries to emulate, I think, more of like a, I would say, more Ruby like yeah. uh, in in what it wants to do, or more Ruby on Rails like in what it tries to do in terms of syntax and. Uh, structure yeah. and yeah i've actually never used ember myself i've used uh um, backbone i think that's the last one on the list and yeah that, that one's a little bit lighter um it's a little bit more bare bones it actually doesn't have data binding you have to like add other libraries to do that, to do that so if you like more minimalistic uh less opinion uh, backbone's pretty good um i've used that even with um, WinJS and put those two together and it worked pretty well so yeah, and uh, I think actually I've used Angular with uh, WinJS as well, and that also worked quite well. Uh, since these are all JavaScript, uh, 
files that you can essentially include in. A lot of times they will work pretty much out of the box or with minor changes. Yep. So uh, to clear to summarize, React is great if you want something that's highly performant um, and you know and very lightweight and you only want to manipulate the views. Backbone is great if you want a little bit more MVC structure, but you still want to keep things lightweight. And Ember is great if you're ready a Ruby on Rails uh, user and, and if you like that sort of framework. Angular, though, I think is only one still with two-way data binding, which is quite nice. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't actually remember. So. Yeah, I think the other ones have one-way data binding. Okay. Oh. Uh, which which means it'll get something from your control. If you change something in the controller, it'll change it in your view. But what's actually nice about two-way da data binding is that if you change something in your view, it'll automatically change that in your controller as well. Whoa. Yeah. Inception. So, so let's actually go and look at that. We'll go into our module tool and open Hello World. Hmm. Beautiful. So as you can see here, uh, right now we have just a really, really plain page, and it says hello. And I'm actually going to open the developer console here so you could see what is happening in the DOM. So as you can see here, we are saying, hey, make this app um, an Angular app by, just by putting ng app on top. And what we're actually saying is, hey, use, uh, use this text box here as the input. So we're going to give this um, ng model um, we're going to call this ng model input text. And that basically starts that data binding process by saying, hey, this is the data that we're going to share. And so now when we bind, hmm, this is uh, exactly the, show up here. So the, the live DOM, Helen, yeah. I think you're expecting the brackets, right? I am expecting if the brackets. You, you're right. I'm going to go into here. Yeah, there you go. And you'll see that we put actually input text here. So we're saying, hey, uh, this model here, this input is going to be what our input text is, and we're going to call, and that's our model. And now with the with the binding, it's actually going to bind this to wherever we put this input text in brackets here. So now whenever we change something in this input, it'll actually change automatically here where we want it to be displayed. Okay, so it's like magic. It's basically um, Angular looks at those brackets and says, oh. I have this spot of data that I need to fill in, and it binds to this thing called input text. Yeah, it'll bind to whatever model um, you're given. So we're going to use this much uh, later on to do a bit m more complex things. And you'll notice that we I talked a lot about controllers, but we don't actually have a controller here. Um, you can actually bind this with with all your logic not on the same page as well. I think that actually makes it look much more impressive than right here when we're saying, oh, yeah, you know, you put the input text here, and yeah. then you're basically getting the input text here. Yeah, it's, it, it looks like magic, really. Um, one quick question. Uh, do we have, can, can we do this in Visual Studio? Can we do this in any text editor? Like, what, uh, what's, what's required here? Yeah, so right now we're using Sublime Text just as a really, really lightweight text editor, but you can absolutely use Visual Studio or anything else as well. We're using Sublime Text primarily because that's the... It's cross-platform. Yeah, it's cross-platform, and a lot of web developers really enjoy using it, so we thought we'd you know, use the tools that other people use for things like you know, JavaScript frameworks, basically. Yeah, but really it's just opening a directory, so yeah, exactly. it's about the same thing as anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're actually opening something in a straight text file like this and you're seeing that you can make changes just straight in this text file, I think it really shows that everything we're doing is basically, you know, straight JavaScript and not that complex. Yep. So now that we've done a, a tiny hello world, let's actually go through and talk about exactly what we did. And the first thing that we'll talk about are directives. So directives are those Angular-only HTML attributes that we add into our application. Um, you could see from, our, if you think back to our Hello World, when we called ng app or when we called something an ng model, those are basically directives. You put them in your HTML tag just to denote that, hey, this is going to be an Angular, uh, this is going to be an element that we're going to use uh, with Angular and it'll attach some specific behavior to the element. So for example, when we set ng app for the entire, um, to the HTML tag that's saying, hey, this entire page is going to be an Angular application. 
And when we set ng model to that text field again, you're saying, hey, this text field is going to be an uh, Angular mo data model. And you can tell something is an Angular directive by the prefix that it has, which will usually be ng dash or data dash ng dash. Or actually, data dot ng, data dash ng colon is, I think, what it usually is. Yeah. So if you look in search tool for a lot of your favorite websites, you'll probably see something like this already. Well, data dash is, uh, is the common um, uh, attribute if any type of JavaScript or any type of library wants to add data to the DOM. Um, and it, or wants to denote or say something about that particular element in the DOM. And uh, it doesn't just work for Angular, it works for a lot of other frameworks who use data dash as well. Yeah. This is, um, it's just a nice, so that's why there are two formats. There's the ng dash, you know, to keep it simple, and then there's the data dash ng, which is sort of the more universal model that's out there. Um, the directives in Angular are actually one of its key features because there are so many directives that you can use and that and it makes it so easy to just to note that this is an angular uh, element instead of for example in jquery or whatever else you have to actually go in your javascript and say hey this i want to do something to this element so next let's talk about models and controllers so we touched on this lightly a little bit before but the models are what you are basically the data that you're going to pass around, and the controllers are where your logic is going to sit. So um, a module is probably the, uh, the biggest type of sort of directive, and everything is going to sit inside of a module. So the module you can think of as the container for your entire application. And you declare it pretty simply uh, in your Angular code. So you'll have one JavaScript. We're going to basically use one JavaScript file for all your Angular code. You can, of course, separate this out a little bit more, but we don't have that much to sh um, we don't have that much code today. So we're just going to keep it in one file. And at the top of your file, you're just going to type in uh, var and give it give your module a name, and then you'll just use Angular dot module. And uh, and the my app here, that's going to be what you're going to call your app uh, in the in your view. So for, right here, we're just going to give an example, for instance, my app. So this is what you would call your directive with ng app using. And next, you'll see we have some empty brackets here. The empty brackets are basically where you're going to put in your dependencies. So if you, if you need another type of Angular resource, or if you're calling it some specific library, that's where you'd put those. Uh, because we're starting out simple right now, we're not going to use it just quite yet. And um, controllers are what are going to contain, again, the business logic for uh, a part of your application. So you can have multiple controllers per Angular module. Um, you'll typically, these will typically correspond with uh, one core function or, a, or one core view or basically um, you know, one part of your application. And controllers, basically, all they do is they set up your data to be viewed in your HTML. So you're going to, for instance, uh, massage your data, um, reset it in the controller, uh, set it different things, and you're actually going to declare it with uh, some similar syntax. So as you recall, for instance here, we called our Angular application, our Angular module, my module. So you could just declare a controller onto that, as you see here, and give it a name, like my controller. Um, and you'll actually give it a function here. So that's interesting because what we're basically doing is we're going to put our code between these braces here. And you'll see we passed in a scope. So this is how we, we talked about before, we're going, if you need any dependencies, you eject them in the square brackets for a module. Here, if you have any dependencies, you could just simply put them as a parameter for the function. So we already have something here in its scope. Now, scope is something that just every controller is going to need, and that's where you're actually going to keep your data um, models. So that's essentially everything in your scope is going to be what is passed around to your views. So dependency injection is how we're going to specify those dependencies for Angular component that we need. This is basically you know, the scope that we're putting into our controller, and it's what we put in our square braces. Angular is high. Um, Angular is very, very big on dependency injection because that's essentially how you're going to add in only the components that you need for a controller. Instead of declaring everything, for instance, at the top and basically making everything available, you say, well, what do I specifically need for this one controller or this uh, one module? 
and templates are going to be the Angularized HTML that we're going to create. So, um, what, what does Angularized mean? <laughs> That I, I'm not sure that that's a real term, that that's <laughs> basically just what I put in. It's any, you know, it's any HTML code that you're going to use along with Angular. So instead of saying, um, so we're going to just call those templates. Because as you can see, or as we saw before, what you see in your, uh, what you see in your browser, that code is going to be different. Um, that's going to be actually the rendered view. But what you're using to create that sort of Angular HTML shell, uh, which in our hello world, for instance, was this. This is going to be a template. You, I mean, the templates will typically, you'll see the braces, and this is based, and you're going to see a lot of that Angular structuring. So it's basically the, yeah, I mean, template it's, is a really straightforward word. That's exactly what it does. Angularized, right? like hello, angularized does, means that it's easy yeah. the double brackets, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So your templates are going to be basically the, um, you know, the, the pre, the like constructed views, or the, do you know what? They're the templates for your They're views. Templates, yeah. I, I don't know why I keep trying to explain a really simple <laughs> word. It is a template. <laughs> uh, so yeah, actually, let's go in and build out just those simple pieces for our Chirp Angular app. Awesome. Um, so just to orient you guys around Sublime, for those of you who haven't used it before. Uh, you can actually access your, you know, your file structure here, and we have one giant folder for our Chirp app, which I put in desktop because, you know, easy access. I know a lot of people don't like that, but hey, it's a demo, and uh, you'll see that I have the completed folder here, and I also just have, you know, the rest of the folder structure here. So the completed folder has what? Oh, the completed folder basically has what we're going to end up with at the end of the module, but we're going to create the module from scratch in a new folder that we're going to start here. I just wanted to showcase this because if you haven't used Sublime Text before, this is not, you know, this is not like any crazy project view like you might see in Visual Studio. This is basically just going to be it's just doing the, the, the folder structure. structure. Yeah, yeah, you're just seeing the directories as they exist here. And you can see, you know, the other modules here, and it maps basically one on one to this. So I've just created this empty app folder, and this is where we're going to start off. If you want to follow along and you want some more detailed instructions, you can, of course, go to our GitHub repo. Let me go here. And as you can see, we're actually going to go through basically what we're going to do here in this module two folder. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually create a mod an Angular module and a controller. Um, in a and that's going to be the file that we're going to contain the rest of our code in. So I'm going to just create a new file here in Sublime, and I'm going to, uh, you know what? I'm just going to copy paste this code in, <laughs> so so I can describe it to you better. So what we did here is we basically constructed a module, like we said before. Uh, we're calling the this variable app, and we're going to use that throughout our application. But more specifically, it is the Chirp app, and that's what we're going to call it in the view later on. And now, and we just constructed a really empty controller. Um, called main controller and I'm actually going to just start passing in the scope right now and leave this blank for the time being. I'm going to save this and I'm going to call this just chirp app.js. Putting an application folder and I'm actually going to put it in a separate folder called JavaScripts just to clean that up a little bit and save that here. And next we're going to create that basically main page that you'll see when you're on our Chirp application. So because Java, um, because HTML is really, really verbose, I'm going to use this template. Otherwise, it'll take me forever to type out. Yeah, those brackets are really annoying. Yeah. And what we're going to do here is we're basically going to create that HTML file. So um, right now, this doesn't have any Angular code in it. As I would say, it is not Angularized. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, I'm, tr I'm trying to make it a thing, OK? I'm trying to make this term happen. Um, <laughs> Hashtag Angularized. Angularized. Yeah, exactly. And all we have in here is it's just basically a form. We're going to, in, within this form, we're going to have an input called your name. Uh, for your name, and we're going to have a text area for your chirp. Uh, normally, you know, you type in. Uh, normally, you would need to type in your name if you're building an application like this because it just saves your username. But because we don't have a backend yet, we're just going to have 
you manually enter your name whenever you're whenever you're cheaping whenever you're cheaping exactly <laughs> and just and there's going to be a submit button i made a a div for a feed down here but that's obviously not going to be used yet and i have an extra div here so I'm just going to save this and i'm going to call this main.html So right now, if we go in and we actually look at main.html, it's not very pretty, right? Um, it's completely unstyled. And basically, I just have the name input and the say something here. And I can type in things here, but it won't really do anything since that submit button isn't connected to anything. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to start angularizing this. <laughs> and I'm going to put the ng app actually on the body instead of the full um, HTML document. And I'm going to call this chirp app. It's important for what you do here to map to, act, or what you're calling the application here with ng app to actually map to what you're going to call it here. So I can't call it whatever I want. It has to match Angular, the yeah. module name of the, the Angular module name. Exactly. And you'll we'll also want to include this chirp app.js file. So for time's sake, I'm going to, again, just copy this. And so what is that there? You're, um... Yeah, exactly. I'm going to explain it in just one second. So we're going to call in two scripts. One is, like we said before, we need um, the, basically the AngularJS uh, base scripts from the Google CDN. So I'm just call, pulling in that CDN code here with this first script. And the second thing we're going to do is we're actually going to link this to our chirpapp.js that we created in our JavaScripts folder. So the order of that is you know, pretty important. You want your Angular code to go first so that your, your app actually knows what it's accessing. And we're going to save this. Now, this won't actually do much because we don't have a controller or anything in here. So what we want to do is we want to you know, specify, hey, what part of the app is this controller that we're making called main controller uh, modifying? And what we're going to modify is basically this main div. So we'll just so whatever is basically under this div or within this div is going to be um, accessible with the ng controller. Okay. And again, it's important for this name to match with what you're going to pass into main controller, uh, what your name is going to be here. Oh, I got a good question in the, um, in the um, chat. Uh, they asked, uh, wouldn't you place the, uh, the CDN link um, at the bottom of your file rather than the top? Um, sometimes you do that for loading, for performance, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's if you want your site to be extremely performant, extremely fast, you absolutely should place your JavaScript includes at, at the bottom of the page because the way that JavaScript, um, the way that these things load is you'll have that first, um, you'll first pass where you load all your elements in, and then you'll actually load, and then you'll go through and you'll load your scripts, yeah. and then that'll go through and, and basically connect what you're connecting with the script. Uh, this is just the you know the very standard. HTML way that people have learned. Yep. So I'm doing this for simplicity stake, sake instead of actually making anything Nothing super fits. performant yeah. today. <laughs> um, if we wanted to do that, we we probably would also do a couple of other tweaks. Um, but this, I think, makes things very clear. So after we've added in that controller, next we want to actually connect our model and view. So because we don't actually have anything in our controller here, let's actually learn what we would put in. So what we're going to put in our controller are basically our, our models, and we're going to, again, modify with that scope. And we're going to use data binding to, to pass whatever we're doing in the controller over to our uh, view or our template. So something that we're going to use that's really important is that scope that you see we passed in before. And what that scope does is it links your controller to your view. So that kind of sounds confusing, but basically, whatever you're going to attach to that uh, scope is going to be uh, sh is going to be made available to your template view as uh, a variable. 
So similar to what we did before with that NG model, if you apply that NG model with something that is available in the scope, that's going to be able to be used. This is a confusing concept until you see it in action. So we're going to show that in a little bit. But what you want to basically remember is the scope contains all your models uh, for the data that you're going to be using. And the scope is always configured within, that con within the controller for that specific section. Um, and every time you're creating a new controller, you're setting basically a new scope inside of that controller um, and that element that you, con that you created that controller for. And so let's talk about displaying and binding data. As you've seen before in our Hello World application, you can display data um, once you have a model for it just by simply using some double braces. You're going to actually bind that data using directives like what we did before. So uh, what we did was we used ng model for our Hello World, and that will create that two-way data binding we talked about, which will basically bind your data uh, from both your view into your controller as well as your controller into your view. So whenever something changes in your view, that changes automatically in our controller as well. And our ng bind is a slightly different function, and that will basically create one-way data binding. So whatever changes in your controller will actually populate out to your view, but it won't go back the other way. And ng bind is obviously more performant than ng model since it doesn't have to actually create that watching. But we're going to use ng model because once, when we're populating the form, it's actually going to change the model that we've created in our controller, as you'll see so right now. Are, so we're doing two-way data binding. Yeah, we're going to do two-way data binding. One-way data binding is really useful if you're, for instance, you know, displaying some data out that you fetch from the server that you know isn't necessarily going to change. But especially for something like what we're doing here, where you're going to input data and you want that to be, uh, you want that data to, you know, have some sort of action applied onto it. It's just so useful because you don't have to, you know, pass that data back into your controller. It's already there for you whenever you're changing it. So it's basically one way is good for um, for displaying. Two ways is good for user input. Yeah, exactly. So now what we want to do here is first we want to go into our main controller and we want to start creating some, some variables on our scope. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to create uh, posts. And we're going to make this an empty array for now. I'm actually going to remember to attach this onto our scope. And we're going to make this an empty array for now. And that will basically contain all the posts that we're going to display on the page. Once we have a backend, of course, we're going to get our posts uh, from there. But for now, we're just going to start it out empty every time. Now, when you add stuff to the scope variable, it goes to any other controller that's using it can have access? No. Um, so the scope that you're creating is only going to be available for whatever you put in your controller here. So, um, so for instance, this div right here, this is Am I highlighting that correctly? Okay, so so because we put in our main controller onto this main div, the only things that can access this, um, the scope variables are going to be inside this div. If, for instance, we had another div down here, uh, and we gave that another controller, then that controller will, uh, then the elements underneath that will only be able to access that controller's own scope. Its own scope. Okay, got it. Yeah. We're going to talk about root scope a little bit later on, but there is a way to, you know, provide entire scope to your entire module. Uh, that shouldn't be used too much. We're going to use it to, you mean for one thing are at bad? the end. Yeah, <laughs> believe it or not, globals are bad. Uh, there's a preferred way to actually pass data around Angular application, and we'll get to that, I think, in module five. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to actually create another scope variable, and we're going to call that new post. And this is what's going to basically contain our, um, we're going to model this to our form right here. So what we'll need right now is we'll need a name and we'll also need uh, some text, basically the text of that chirp. So let's go and initialize that real quick. I'm going to call the, the username created by, make that empty for now. You probably don't need those bars, right? Uh, no, but it's nice to know what you're, it's just, I think, uh, a good practice to say, hey, what, are, what is going to actually be used? Yeah. And actually, uh, because we're going to use ng model later on, we want to specifically tie, for instance, the, the text uh, for your, the text box for your name specifically to a new post that created by, for instance. So as soon as that changes, this is actually going to change. Um, and you'll actually, by, 
by adding it in here, you'll actually also know exactly what models you're going to use explicitly. So it, it makes for a cleaner code, I think, to initialize it here, even if you don't necessarily need to. I'm also going to initialize text. And I'm going to do something else. I am going to create a, actually create an at. Because as you've seen in Twitter, and as you're going to see in our application, we want some timestamps. And so the created at is basically going to store a timestamp. I'm going to leave that empty for now. Uh, but that's all we'll really need here. So now let's actually go through and add each of these scope variables and attach them as models here. Um, when I say each, I actually do not mean we should do the timestamp as well. We're actually just going to do the created by on the your name text input, and I'm going to call that, or I'm going to use ng model, and I'm going to use new post dot created by. And you'll notice that I'm actually not using scope uh, here, whereas I, I use scope here. And that's because this entire scope is already passed to this controller. And the only things it can access are just basically scope variables. So you could just call them by what you named them here. Scope is implicitly defined. Yeah, scope is implicitly defined. And for the text area, we're going to do something similar. We're going to do ng model, and we're just going to give it new post. I'm actually going to also set this input up here for the name as required real quick. So now that we have these two, um, what are we actually going to do when this, when this form posts? Well, we'll need to add in the, the post here to the form. And for simplicity and just for timing purposes, I'm actually going to paste the rest of this in. So what we're going to use is we're going to use ng submit for the form posting. And it'll basically call a post function. And in here, we're going to create another. Um, let me just go down here, paste that in as well. We're going to create a post function on our scope so that it can actually be called in our application here. I'm gonna indent this a little bit better so you could see. But what we're doing in our form is we're calling ng submit post. So whenever this form, uh, whenever the submit button on this form is clicked, it's actually going to call this uh, post function. And so we then define that post function actually on our scope as well. So the scope will be, um, so the scope will be a function that basically creates uh, or adds a created at. For, to the new post here. So whereas before it was blank and we didn't necessarily change it in our model at all, we're actually going to change that here and make that date dot now, which is essentially going to be the current timestamp. And then we're actually going to post this or push this to posts. We're going to uh, take whatever we created in new post, uh, the, the actual populated post, and we're going to add that into our scopes dot post. And then we're going to um, reset new post here. So, so once we save, once we save this, you'll notice that we actually don't display the chirp feed here at all, and we're going to display that in just one minute. Uh, we're going to display that using our basically filters. Or actually, I don't think I'm supposed to do this. That's, that's what we're. At. Yeah. That's what I was asking about. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, okay. So once we so once we add this in here, we should actually be able to post into our posts array. Now um, we're going to just actually be able to see our post array if we actually display it here. So let's go in and create that display. So we're going to use we're going to display this pretty primitively right now, um, just by using the by creating a div. And what we're going to use we're going to use this interesting ng repeat direct directive using some filtering. What does ng repeat do? Excellent question. Let's look at some definitions for that. Oh, no. I can't because I don't have it. 
I'm sure you, I'm sure you could freehand it. Yeah, I am going to just tell you what it does. So uh, I had this entire section on like filters and repeating, and I don't know. Where got it is lost now. on the internet. I got I lost it somewhere between pushing it up to GitHub and now. But basically, what ng repeat does is it's going to take this post array here and it's going to say, well, for every post that I have in posts, so it's going to iterate through all of post. And it's going to take every single element and it's going to assign that temporarily to post. And it's actually going to create a new scope in here. I hope that's not too confusing for you. And what it's going to do is it's going to make that post be available to whatever is subsequently inside this div. We're going to perform some, uh, some filtering functions onto it using order by. So uh, typically, if you don't have this right now, it'll just, you know, create populate that list for you, uh, top to bottom, and you know whatever's first in that in post is going to be displayed first. By using order by and giving it uh, an element here, what we're actually saying is, hey, can you actually order um, what, how we're going to like, traverse through posts by its created at times? Um, so it's going to you know, do it chronologically, essentially. And I'm passing it another thing, tr um, another parameter here, true, and that is basically the third parameter for order by is basically, do you want to reverse this order? So I'm saying true here simply because I want it to be displayed reverse chronologically with the most recent post first. And then you'll see that there's some extra directives that I added in here that are pretty interesting. ng class odd will basically apply this class onto any, um, like, all the odd posts uh, for within our posts, and ng even is going to apply that to all the even posts. Now, this will be useful for styling a little bit later on. So stay with me for now on this. And next, you'll see we're going to create a post created by here. So um, the post that created by is going to be just you know displaying the, the username that someone put in, and then it'll just say, the text after a little says, and it's going to show the timestamp. Now, this isn't formatted, formatted at all, so it's not going to look very pretty for now. But let's save this and run our app for the first time. Oh. I just needed to allow that content. No worries here. Um, and you'll see we can type in our name. This, again, looks pretty similar to what we had before. but once we actually click that chirp button, you'll see um, it actually passed that model already to the controller without us having to say anything, just because of the way that ng model does two-way data binding. And you'll see here, since it's pushed it to the post, and post is also bound using this repeat loop, it's automatically going to show up kind of magically. OK. So that was that, the reverse data binding that we were talking about, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Because we're typing in something here, even in our view, it'll bind back into uh, the. It, it's. It binds back. Yeah, into exactly. The scope. It binds back into the scope, and that's accessible within our controller. So we didn't explicitly have to pass, you know, uh, the name or the content of the chirp to our controller. It already knows that because we already created that or the new post as a scope variable. Nice. And the same thing is true for po uh, for the post array. Because the post array is uh, bound to the view, uh, whenever that changes uh, within our scope, like when we add, for instance, our new chirp into it, it's going cheap. to just cheap, cheap into it. <laughs> it's, going to <laughs> it's going to automatically display here. So we can do so we can do a couple of other ones, and you'll see because we uh, use the order by parameter true, it's actually going to display reverse chronologically. So the new things that I'm saying is going to appear on top in that um, in that repeat. So that works. It doesn't work super well, but it works. It's just it's extremely unattractive as a web page, I must say. It's simple. It's, it's, it, it is simple. Yeah, it's it's it very basic. minimalist. <laughs> I think people like that right now. Um, but let's actually go in and add some styling. So we're going to actually just you know, throw some bootstrap on there. That's that's a term that I've heard Stephen use quite often. Just throw some bootstrap so, on there. Yeah, just sprinkle um, it on there. And, <laughs> and add some formatting. And there's a, there's a lot of formatting that we're going to use. So I'm just going to copy this real quick and replace this. 
So, um, so let's actually go through and look at what we changed. All we did is we added in this Bootstrap um, CSS style sheet. And we, of course, also added in this the style CSS here. Um, I don't have that created in, my, in this app folder. So let's actually create that now. And I'm going to call this. Wait, I'm going to call the style the CSS, and I'm actually. If you actually just put the uh, the name of the file on the first line and hit save, it'll actually save it as that. Oh, cool! I didn't know that. I've already saved it separately. I'm going to cheat and get my style sheet from here, and just. Uh, so this is styling this. specific for our app. Yeah, this is styling that I made specifically for our app. So, for instance, it'll change the submit button style, the post, and it's actually going to give it um, according to the different classes that the ng even ng odd gave it. I'm going to give it different background colors accordingly. And I've also you know, formatted the posts a little bit. And, I'm, and that's going to be included here. So I'm going to save this as a new file inside here. I'm going to give it, put it inside a new folder called style sheets and save it here as style.css. Style.css. So now that we see it in a directory view here and we linked it here, we can actually run this. Let me just show you one more thing that I did. So whereas before we basically had three uh, text tags and we, we just put them in line, I'm actually going to format each of the, the cheeps a little bit better. So it'll be, you'll see, but it'll basically say the text on top. It'll say the posted by on bottom. And I'm actually formatting the created by timestamp a little bit using an ng filter. So this is going to, instead of giving it basically the number of milliseconds from the beginning of time, it's actually going to format this into a human readable date format. You can read this a little bit about this a little bit more in the ng or in the Angular documentation. But you're basically saying, hey, filter this uh, number of milliseconds is actually, you know, the date, um, which is uh, as a date, which would be the the time on a certain day. This is much clearer once you actually see it running. So let's go ahead and do that. I always close my pages and I always open up a new one, which is not smart. But there we go. Um, typing in Helen, and then I'm going to type in nice format. I'm going to compliment myself here. And I'm going to click this chirp button. And you'll see that you know, it's actually styled a little bit better. And more importantly, that that date time stamp is going to look much better than it did before. And when we do another one, because of the way that we did our ng even and odd, we're actually going to you know, alternate background colors. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty. So we have this you know, sort of done, but we're actually going to need a couple of new pages. Uh, in, in addition to just this page, we actually will need a login page and, a log, uh, and an authentication page as well. So let's go in and create those. Uh, we're going to just create the templates for now. And you can see here that this is going to basically create the registra registration page. I know I didn't need to delete that comment on top, but it yeah, definitely bothered me. <laughs> and I'm going to sa save this as register. And I and you can see here, this does you know pretty similar things. We're going to give it an ng model here for our username. We're going to give it a password here, for our user password here, and we're actually going to put this all in an auth controller. We've again added some styling in with, with the help of C uh, Bootstrap and our own little CSS file. And we also associate this with that ng app, chirp app, as we did before. So um, we created basically the models for this, but we don't actually have that auth controller that is needed to power this, um, this entire div and this entire authentication element. So let's go in and create that. We're going to actually need to create a new controller for it as well because we don't want because we want to you know separate those scope things. So we're going to create this auth controller separately. And we're going to call that auth controller 
just as we did before here. So as you can see, we're still passing in scope and we're passing in um, a user and an, or, so we're going to create a user scope variable as well as an error message scope variable. Uh, that error message should just display to the user hey, what is, um, you know, what's wrong with your login if their authentication failed. But for now, since we don't actually have an authentication backend, whenever they click login, we're just going to say, hey, thanks for trying to log in with this username. Uh, we're going to do the same for a registration by saying, hey, thanks for registering with this username, and just having that be our login function and a register function for now. So our register HTML, for instance, will do you know, a similar thing to what we did before. Uh, on submit of that registration form, it's just going to call this register function. And pretty much we're going to build the exact same thing as a registration page, but for login. Um, so we can essentially actually just copy this, create a new folder, um, create a new document, make sure to change this to login, and change the button to actually say login, change the header to say login, and that's going to be our login page. It's going to work pretty much exactly the same way as our registration. So what you're going to notice is, hey, you're using the same auth controller for both your login and your register. Why are you doing that? How can you do that? Well, I mean, you can assign controllers to whatever different views you need. And because we, we basically need the same scope variables for both, we're just going to reuse one controller and give them different functions to access. That should not be in there. And we're going to just save this. And that should give it the auth authentication, as well as the login and the registration. So once we save this, we can actually go in and, you know, for instance, look at our registration page. When I you know, try to register, for instance, it's just going to display that registration um, alert here in our error message, which we defined in our form here, uh, which we defined in our scope variable here, as well as our, um, as well as in our form here. And we just bound that to the scope's error message, like so. So because we're running a little bit short on time, um, we're going to save the routing piece, I think, for module five. OK, so you're going to throw that in module five? Yeah. Okay. Um, but but essentially, we're just going to go through and you know, let's look at the three pages that we created. We created a login page here, allow block content. We created a main page here, allow block content. <laughs> and we created that register page here, allow block content. So Stephen is actually going to go through and create the back end for this application now uh, using Node, Express, and Mongo in the next couple of modules. And when we come back, we're going to tie this these three separate pages into one cohesive single page application. So you're actually only accessing it from a single page and not clicking around. And we're going to tie that back end in as well. Awesome. Sounds great. We'll see you guys soon. And we're back. Welcome to module three, where we'll be talking about Node.js and Express, which is the E and the N. N. Me and is not in the order where it should be. I don't know why, but it sounds better that way. So we're going to be talking about Express and um, Node.js today. Um, and I guess to get started, we'll, uh, we'll dive right into what Node is and then uh, kind of a bit about what Express is. And we'll start implementing those backend APIs that the Angular application is going to expect from us um, when it starts running. So um, Really, uh, uh, we'll start with why use Node, um, the NPM, Node, Node Package Manager, Understanding Express, and Routing. So why should you use Node? Well, it runs on JavaScript. Uh, it's based on the same runtime that's in the JavaScript runtime that's in the Chrome browser. Uh, so it's, well, it's a mature um, runtime that's uh, sitting underneath it. Uh, it's completely single-threaded. And um, which means that it's actually pretty fast at optimizing for um, input output. So things like a web server where it really does handle a ton of requests, it can serve those requests and continue to the next one very fast. 
Um, so you can get started. It's really easy, actually. If you want to um, create a simple HTTP server, so assume that you have Node.js installed, I could just actually copy this. It's actually really easy. And um, what I'll do is I'll just copy it into Interactive Console. And um, that should just allow us to run a quick, easy web server. So I'm going to switch over to, uh, let me open up a new uh, window. OK. So I'm going to do Node. And it should take me to Interactive Console. I think if I paste everything in here, cool. So what happened was I just copied uh, exactly what was on the PowerPoint, which is really just creating a HTTP server, so requiring the HTTP module. Requiring Node.js just means, hey, I want to grab this module. Um, afterwards, we're going to do call the create server function on it. And really what it's just going to do is just going to write back with a plain text uh, content type header, uh, hello world. And it'll just listen on localhost 1337, and it should just tell us hello world. So if I go to localhost 1337, hello world. Pretty simple, and that was really fast. So all of a sudden, we created a web server and about like eight lines of code. So that's why Node is awesome. Cool, so I'll kill this server so it's not running on my, uh, on my computer anymore. And um, so we'll continue. Um, now, uh, Express is actually a routing framework that sits on top of Node.js. And so if you remember from the previous example, actually, we had this, um, this uh, right here, uh, right head, content type header, all this like low-level stuff, which is really just the headers for HTTP messages. Instead, uh, it actually just handles that for you. And it makes those APIs a lot nicer and allows us to create this thing called routing, which is essentially routes, um, paths into your server, uh, which allows us to interact with those requests. Um, we can interact with the requests much easier by um, serializing to JSON and XML quite easily. We don't really have to worry too much about headers unless we want to change something. And the really cool thing that I personally like about Express is that it's minimalistic, it's fast, and it's unopinionated. And what I mean by unopinionated is that it doesn't really have um, baked in uh, MVC frameworks or baked in anything, really. It's just um, a routing layer. And you can pick those frameworks and those things, and you can put it on top of it, and you take those pieces. It allows you to stay more agile, and you can update pieces faster rather than having one large framework um, altogether. But that's my personal preference, and um, that's why I like it. So to get started, it's actually really easy to create uh, Express application. The first thing we'll do is, um, so this command here says Express, but actually, so I'm going to go right into demo. Um, we actually need to create, uh, install the Express generator. And uh, so this window is just all screwy. Somebody use this one. Um, and if I go back to my GitHub repository, so if I users, I said word, um, actually, Need the documents folder here. Grab this. So this is the GitHub, GitHub repository. I'm in module three. I'm going to create a new folder called start. It's right next to finish. Finish has what we'll end up with. And um, we'll CD right into that. I'm hoping that path isn't too long for Node. We'll see. OK. So what we first need to do is we need to do Node uh, npm install. And um, so npm is our package manager for Node.js. And uh, the reason why I have to, have to talk about this really quick is because we need to install the Express generator. Um, and we'll hit, uh, we'll use dash g to say that we want it installed globally. If you're using this on, um, I know particularly on OS X, if you're on Linux, um, sometimes you might have to use a sudo command to get this to work. Um, you might hit a permission failed. And so now we have the Express generator, CLI, uh, installed. So now we can just do express. And the command is express dash dash EJS, which just means that we want to use the EJS rendering engine and um, the directory name. So yeah. EJS. And we'll just hit period because we want it here. And what this will do is we'll create a basic uh, bare bones express application. And in order for us to actually get things going, we have to install all the dependencies that we need. So we'll just do npm install. And npm install will actually install uh, everything. And I'll. Uh, How do you know what dependencies you need? I was about to just go to, uh, see it. So if we go to uh, um, Notepad um, and go to uh, package.json, ooh, this is not formatted very nicely. Um, so package.json is a JSON file which uh, has metadata about our application. So um, the name of the application, it just defaults to what the name of the directory was. So it's start. Um, 
Uh, it's, it's a private app. This is metadata for the Node package manager. But the most important thing is the dependencies here. So these dependencies tell us which packages, it's really just a manifest, of the packages required to um, get this app going. So we need body parser, cookie parser, all this other stuff, express, um, to actually get things going. So that's how we know. And um, so now we've created our express application. I'm going to go ahead and open this with uh, Sublime so I could have a nice, um, a nice look at the folder. So we have app.js, and then inside that we have our roots. So um, let me see. I'm going to pop back to my PowerPoint to keep myself on track. So I talked about NPM lightly. Um, it's a command line package manager for useful libraries on Node.js. Um, some people also actually use it for front-end frameworks, too. Um, you can also use NPM for browser frameworks uh, as well. Uh, it's akin to pip or Python, uh, pip for Python or gem for Ruby, uh, and it comes bundled with the Node.js installation. So unlike uh, pip, where I think in Python 2.7 or something, it doesn't actually come with it. This actually comes bundled together. So if you install Node.js, you actually get NPM as well. Um, package.json is a manifest for all the required packages that you actually need. Um, it, tells all, uh, it tells the, uh, the system what libraries you need to actually run your code. And NPM interacts with package.json very, um, uh, very frequently. Um, so we specify the developer dependencies as well as the production development dependencies. That's a little bit more advanced, so we won't talk about that today. And as well as the CI test, um, generally when you do things like Travis CI, um, Visual Studio Online, things like that, they'll look for NPM start as the, or NPM test as the entry point for running your test. Okay. So I'll go ahead and start uh, with routing. And uh, I'm going to start with a, uh, so the routing, um, routing and um, Express allows us to create these paths into our server, such as WAC auth, WAC login. And um, so this is actually not the actual URL of the application. I believe it's chirp. Uh, um, chirp dash MVA. Chirp dash MVA, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it does a path to our, uh, to our server, and that's what the routes do. So um, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to actually jump into some live coding here. So we have our, um, our basic boilerplate app.js. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove these, uh, um, these two directories here, um, just because or these two files, index.js and user.js. It's just something that Express puts in there as by default. I'll go ahead and actually just copy it, uh, just because it's useful for us to know uh, what those things are, or to have, um, we'll, we'll use in a second. Um, we're going to remove the, uh, the references here. So in, in Node.js, when you want to um, pull in reference to another JavaScript file called modules, um, we have to use the require um, statements that actually require JS. You can read more about it. But it actually imports our, our um, files. So instead of using um, uh, routes and index and users, we're going to create two new files here. We're going to call one api.js, and we're going to call the other um, authenticate.js. Cool. So now um, we have api.js and authenticate.js. They're empty right now. But what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and change this to API and API. I'm going to comment this one out, but I'm going to keep it. I'm going to um, go ahead and change it for authenticate because we're going to do the API first, and then we'll do the, um, the authentication APIs. So uh, authenticate. Let's see if you I got it. Spell. Yep. Boom. OK. And um, instead of routes, we'll use uh, users will use authenticate, and then that'll pull that in. Um, finally, uh, Express has these uh, dot uses here. And so it's used for a couple of things. It's used for setting uh, which routers we'll use. And we'll talk about routers in a second. And it also talks about, uh, also uses um, our, uh, for middleware. And I'll also talk about middleware in a bit. But most importantly is that we need to change our uh, routers that we're going to use. So API and Authenticate will be an Express router. and Instead of just using uh, the baked-in default ones, we're actually going to use the ones that we, we've defined. So for any path that starts with API um, that comes from our local host or whatever the name of the server, the host name is Slack API, we're going to route to the, we're going to assign that to the API router. And any route that is the, that starts with um, authenticate or auth, we'll just use auth for short, we'll point that to the authenticate router. It's pulling up all the Angular stuff. Um, do you want to comment out the authenticate? Yep. Thank you. 
because that will crash if we do that. Okay, cool. So now we actually pulled those in. Now, if you remember, I did copy and paste some boilerplate code. Oh, I lost it. Oh, well. Um, so I've actually gone into the readme, which is just guides you through exactly everything I'm doing right now. Um, we will have a, um, some boilerplate code here, which is, okay, right here. So uh, what this does really is it uh, pulls in the express module. Um, it says, hey, uh, here's the express router. And what it's going to do is we're going to do some stuff, and then eventually we're going to export this module as a router so it can be used by the app.js. Um, OK, so in the sum implementation part, we're actually going to uh, start doing some routing. So we could do like router.route, and we can pick the uh, API that we want to do. So uh, we are on API, so we want post. And so post will be the cheats that we have. We'll call those uh, post. And um, really kind of the way it works is like it's, it's seen as kind of like a um, kind of like a resource. So we'll have um, for this API, we'll assume that it'll um, we'll have a get and we'll have a post. A get will return all of our posts and a post request from the client will um, create a new post. So um, we can do router.route post and then we could say um, get. And so this will return all post. So it returns all the posts that we need for the uh, um, that's in the database. But currently, we don't have a database. So what we're going to do is we're just going to add the function, the request handler. Request handlers in Express take two functions, rec and res. And um, basically, that means that, hey, uh, we have a request object, which comes from the client, and a response object, which comes from the server. And uh, we request the object, or the, re the request object has all the things that the client asks for. And the response object has what you respond with. And um, in our case, because uh, temporary, solu temporary uh, solution, we don't really have uh, our MongoDB server set up yet. So what we'll do is we'll just respond with a OK, and we'll just say, hey, to do, we got to do this. So we could do res.send. Um, and I believe I can just put like message here. I could say to do. Uh, return all post. Okay. And uh, so that's for the, the get function or the get um, the dot get will give us the get method. We also want the dot post because we want to be able to do the get endpoint and the post endpoint. And the post will do um, the same thing. We'll use a request handler function signature, which is uh, rec res. And um, so we'll just say, we won't really pay attention to what the request does. We'll just do, again, a temporary solution. Um, and it'll just be to do to say, hey, in this case, though, we're instead of uh, returning all posts, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new post. And I'll say to do. Post, post that. <laughs> OK. And um, now. Uh, I can just put the semicolon since I finished this whole line. And what we'll do now is we'll just export uh, router uh, because I've added the routes to the route. And because of that, in app.js, when we do the uh, require on API, it'll be seen as a router. And app.use expects a router um, to be registered with Express. I want to make sure I didn't go too far here. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go ahead and just try this out. So um, one thing I use to test a lot on, um, for web applications, and I don't think I use incognito. I think I have to use a regular one. If I do Chrome uh, apps. So if you go into Chrome Store, there's two cool uh, applications you could use just to test um, apps. And actually, the one I like is installed. There's Postman, uh, which is a REST client here. Oh, I was expecting zoom it. Uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to quickly install advanced REST client because I prefer to use that because I'm just more familiar with it. Uh, but basically, it's just a client that will allow us to um, test our web APIs without actually having to um, write some code to actually use it. So you're going to use this to create the, uh, to basically make some GET and POST requests? Yep, exactly. So let's, uh, let me see if I can zoom that in. And I can't actually do it without running the server. So uh, if I do ls to show you I'm right here, and if I didn't screw anything up, if I do npm start, 
we should be able to start the application. It starts at bin www, which is the starting script. And um, so if I go to back to the interest client, I say localhost 3000 API post. If I do a get, I should get a response. It says, hey, return all post. So that's interesting. Is it that whenever you make um, an API router, then all of the methods below it will be for auth? We'll, we'll, sorry, we'll have the API. Um, yeah, so, and, yeah, so because I put this stuff in uh, API, and this starts at post, so this is defined the post, but you can notice that there's no API here. If you go back to app.js, which is responsible for registering all of our routers, we notice that we mounted the API router to the API path which means that every um, route that's defined API will start with WAG API. Okay. So that's how that works. So cool. So if I do a post um, here, it'll say, hey, to do create a new post. So we know that we have that. And if we did a put or something else, we would expect to have a 404 not found. Uh, my mouse is crazy. There we go. Uh, if I do post here, 404 not found, because we didn't define that API, which is how we expect to answer. Okay. So let's get more fancy. Let's do some more stuff here. Um, the last thing we want to do is Helen's going to talk about what resources are in, in um, Angular. But um, Angular actually kind of imposes one little thing on our server. And it basically says that um, if you're going to define something as what's called a resource, it needs to have a certain type of conformity on its REST API, which means that um, we want to be able to uh, manipulate a collection of, of, of resources as well as individual resources. So because of that, we should also make another route that is specific for a certain post. So um, Express actually has this really cool um, syntax here where you can just put a colon ID, which will um, automatically parse the path and pass this ID as the parameter. So um, if I uh, pass, I'll actually just show you what I mean because it's way easier just to show you than to explain it. So I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to do get, and this will return a particular post, okay? And uh, so get, uh, we'll do post, sorry, uh, not post, um, function rec res. So it's the same type of uh, response handler that we expect that we had done from before. And so we have get function rec res, and what we'll do is we'll, again, we'll just say res.send message to do return post with ID and I'll add the um, request.params.id. So um, what this does, it basically, uh, this params object will parse out what this ID thing was and pass it as, as a variable ID. And then we have, um, so what we'll see is actually what we pass in the path. Now, what's cool about this is that by doing this, we've actually effectively created an infinite number of uh, routes because ID could be anything. So you could do WAC API, WAC post, WAC 1234, 1238, 123, whatever, whatever the name of the, uh, the path is, which is really neat because it um, kind of expands and makes your API flexible. So if you've seen on websites before, you might have like Facebook or whatever, it's like WAC post, WAC add new comment. Um, that's what they're doing. They're basically, those aren't sp um, actually hard coded. They just have a variable and the server knows what to do with that part of the URL. So um, if I do a uh, put here, so what we want to do for a put request, we'll say uh, modifies or updates. So it's kind of like CRUD, basically, um, if you're familiar with databases, but um, just update existing post. And again, we'll just do function rec res. And what we'll do here is we'll just put the res.send and again, we'll just say to do, and we'll instead we'll put, um, instead of returning a post with an ID, we'll just go ahead and add a post um, or modify a post. So this is what we call routing. We're just routing these different types of hand, um, these, uh, uh, these different routes from, uh, for the client to actually access the handlers, which is our logic, our business logic of how we want to handle requests. 
Um, I believe I have one more uh, get, put, and... Post, delete? Delete, yeah. We don't yeah. need to do the post. Yeah, so what, what Steven's doing is he's basically creating a fully RESTful API um, that allows you to you know, do all the standard CRUD operations like create, read, update, and delete. I mean, obviously, he's not doing every single one, but uh, by, by creating an API like this, it basically gives you all the methods that you might need to access for you know, modifying an object conceivably from, um, from any other structure or method. So for instance, the ID thing. I mean, now that he's created something for, for every single post, once that post up, that ID could presumably be for every single post, right? So every single post can have their actual unique endpoint where you could get the contents of that particular post, and you could change it or delete it or whatever else. Yep, exactly. OK, so um, that, so we started up our server. So let's test our new APIs just so that we can um, make sure that those worked as well. So I have post, and I could say one, two, three, four. So I want to get a post of ID one, two, two, three, four. If I send, I'll get a response saying return post of ID one, two, two, three, four. So that's exactly what I passed here. You can tell it's being parsed. Um, if I do a post, I should expect a four, four not found because this, AP, this route is not specified, which is great, four, four not found. And then finally, um, we'll do a put, just to say, I'll we'll do the put and the delete. Let's see, modify post and delete, which will hit the delete route, delete post with, with ID 2234. So, um, so we've created our basic post routes. Now let's do something more interesting, which is every application needs authentication. Almost every app does. Like, uh, we want to know who are the people that are using our application. So to do that, um, what we'll do is we'll use NPM, which is very similar, uh, like I mentioned before, it's like PIP or um, NuGet, which really just allows us to um, install packages that are useful for us to do implementations like authentication. So um, to actually use it, uh, actually uh, one, one thing that's really useful here is if you go to npmjs.org um, and you can just search for any package that you want, and I'm going to go to um, Passport. And this is what we're going to use. We're going to use Passport, which is really just a simple um, authentication library for Node.js. And every, every one of these guys starts with how to install, which is really, if it's not a CLI, it's pretty much installed locally, which means um, npm install Passport will install that locally right here. So to do that, we'll go ahead and go into kill that. npm install Passport. Now, one thing that those installs don't say, um, which as a, as a Node developer took me a few months to realize, is that um, you can just do dash dash save, and what this will do is actually save that um, the dependency of this package in the package.json, um, so that uh, next time you have to run this app, all you have to do is just do npm install, and it'll actually install all of those dependencies for you, rather than having to reinstall and say npm install for each one again. OK, so we did that. We also need to install um, passport local which uh, we'll talk about in a bit, but basically Passport Local is required to do um, local authentication. Local authentication, I mean, not Facebook, not Twitter, not Microsoft account, not Google, just your own local authentication schema. And um, that's what we'll be using right here. So we'll do uh, Passport Local save, and then we need one more, which is um, since we're actually making our own users and storing those in our own database, we don't, um, it's never a good idea to store passwords. So we're going to just store password hashes. And then to do that, uh, there's a great library called bcrypt. And again, if you want to get like the, the documentation for any of these libraries, or if you want to make your own library, um, you just go to npmjs.org. I generally just go npmjs.org, whack packages, and then the module name. And that'll just give you what the module name is, or what the, the readme or the documentation for a module is. So we'll use uh, bcrypt-node.js. And that will give us a, um, a really easy API to use so we can create password hashes. All right. So now I have everything installed. Um, I'm going to go back to app.js. And I need to require a few things. Usually when you install a package, you need to require, like, um, you need to import those packages. So I'm going to grab passport, require, oh, passport, OK. And then I'm going to do. Um, I don't need to actually grab bcrypt here. We don't need it. Um, and there's one more thing, actually, that we do need to grab, which is Express doesn't really come with much. It has, um, when Express 4 came out, they debundled a lot of stuff. So we actually have to install the cookie parser or the session manager as well. So npm install um, express-session. 
and we'll save that too. And we'll require that as just a module called session equals require express staff session here. And then if I go to, uh, I'm going to put it right below the logger. I'll just do app.use. So uh, we'll talk about middleware in a bit. So well, middleware sits between your app, between your request and your application. And app.use is really just a, um, a way that we add middlewares to it. Um, I don't want to get too much into it, but basically it stand, stands between the person making, the client making the request and the logic that handles the routing control. So you could do some common functionality like parsing cookies or what we'll actually use it for ourselves to create our own middleware is to enforce API authentication. So right now I'm just going to create, uh, I'm just going to use session to, uh, as a middleware. I think it's like this. I'll double check. I think uh, session and then there's a secret here and pick whatever secret string you want. This is just used for um, creating the session hashes. Um, and then, so now that I've added the session middleware, um, the only other thing I have to do is actually have to add the um, passport middleware and I'll add it at the bottom. Uh, I won't get into it, but uh, middleware a lot of times matters in the order that you use it. So we have to use passport dot um, uh, initialize, I believe. I gotta, I'm gonna have to double yeah, check. Yeah, passport dot initialize. Okay, that's it. And then um, afterwards, uh, app dot use uh, passport dot session. Mm -hmm. So if I if I did this in reverse, um, if I did this in reverse, passport dot session would just choke yeah. because. Um, you need to initialize. You need to pass the initialization middleware first, and then afterwards the, the session. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, that was a lot. Yeah. Um, and just one more point on the middleware. I mean, it's not that difficult. Basically, the uh, the order that you're defining that middleware in the app.js that's the order that they're going to be run in. So you know, the first one is going to check for something, and then the, and then it'll just go next and next and next, whatever middleware that applies to the route that you're looking at. Okay. Cool. So um, now we're going to actually add authentication. Uh, we're going to use the passport library, uh, which is um, which we just added. We're going to implement sign up, login, and log out routes. And instead of uh, storing users to MongoDB, for now we'll just use in memory so that we don't have to talk about Mongo until the next section, session. So I talked about testing the APIs, and um, we're going to create mini routes, which we've mini routers that we've already um, done. But we're going to use the same model, um, the same routing model over our authentication piece. Okay, so let me jump back down, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a new file here called uh, passport init.js. So this is just a clean way. This is actually Helen's idea um, of basically um, cleaning up our passport implementation because passport can be, although it's simple, it's a lot uh, just to take in and. Essentially, Passport has like its own sort of like middleware. It's they call it strategies, and uh, in order to actually do it, we're gonna just copy some boilerplate code um, to bootstrap our Passport implementation. So um, I'm gonna copy and I'll explain what each piece does. It doesn't actually work, so don't be too fret about having magic code. We're gonna go in and implement it, but um, I need to copy some basic stuff because it's really specific to the library. Okay. So Passport has uh, strategies, and um, like I mentioned before, uh, we have to do npm install Passport local, which means that we're going to grab that local strategy. We're going to grab bcrypt, which is our, authentic, our um, cryptology um, framework or library, which will just really just create hashes for our passwords so we don't have to store the user passwords um, directly. And we're going to have this, users, uh, this temporary users data store, which is really just a JavaScript object where we'll sta save our users, and then um, in the future we'll replace that with MongoDB. So um, the first thing we'll do is we'll implement the signup API, which the signup API is uh, pretty simple. What we're going to do is uh, you get called. Uh, we, we register this as a signup strategy, and it'll be a local strategy. And this little thing just says, "Hey, pass the whole uh, express request to our call to our callback here," and this is our callback. The callback has a request, which is the request coming in from request uh, from Express, the username, the password, and done. So. Passport actually often automatically parses out the username and password from a form body um, when you do the REST request. So we can just assume that it has it. And what we'll do is we'll do users um, at and username. So we'll grab the username that, that we have here. And uh, if you're familiar with JavaScript, 
if you just pick the uh, at username, it's just going to be a key value store. So what we'll do is we'll create a um, we'll we'll create a new object. Before I do that, though, what we want to do is go and check if the user already exists, so we don't have more than one user with the same name. So we'll say if users username, meaning that if uh, I got anything besides zero or null, um, we can just return done with an error saying uh, username already taken because we're trying to sign up with the same username if you hit this path. And we will do a um, users, uh, we'll do false, which will just basically say, hey, um, we did not sign in, and here's your error. Otherwise, we'll create a add user to DB, and in our case, we will just be storing it locally, so we're not actually using real DB, this is all in memory. And uh, we'll say username is equal to the username that was passed in as a parameter, and the password will be so if you look actually down here, we have invalid password and create hash. These are some helper functions that we pre-wrote, which uses bcrypts APIs to create cryptographic hashes. So instead of storing the password directly, which is very bad, you don't want to do that, instead we'll do um, create hash, and we'll just simply store the hash. And later what we can do is when we, someone tries to log in, we'll just compare the hash with the password and see if the, the, the computed hash matches the one that we stored. So uh, password. And what will happen is it'll just return the hash, and we'll store it back in the password. Finally, um, instead of having an object here, so in Node.js, it's really traditional when you pass, when you call an API, your first, um, or when you call a callback, your first parameter is usually an error. So if it's null, that means that you don't have an error. If it's not null, that means you do. And the other parameters are usually just specific to that um, actual API or that function. So we'll say users um, username is what we'll pass. So we'll say we'll pass back the entire object, the user's object that we just created. OK, so that's our sign up implementation. Now we have to do our login implementation. So again, these are like, like weird little middlewares. But essentially, um, when we hook this up to our API, um, our authentication API, um, because Passport kind of sits between our users and um, our clients and our actual route handler. It'll detect that um, we try to do an authentication because we're going to have specific authentic authentication APIs. And Passport will, um, these functions really instruct Passport how to save users, how to um, hash the passwords, and how to provide a user back to Passport. All Passport's really doing is just kind of serializing, storing those users into a session. Um, into an HTTP session and then storing out. So if you ever use a website that like, hey, your, your session expired or whatever, that means that's the same exact thing. We're actually just storing you in like a little cache you can think of on the server and you get a cookie and it tells who, what user you are after you've logged in. Okay, so um, passport use login. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the same thing here. So we're gonna say if um, the user at username so we're going to get the username from the request. If the user username does not exist, um, then we just need to return done user not found. So you can put whatever verbose error you want. Otherwise, we'll put, um, and we'll say false, you did not log in. Did I put true on the last one I did? Yeah, OK. If it's not false, then it's, it's considered a successful login. OK. And then, um, so the user is not found. And then we also need to check if the password is valid. So we can say is valid password. Is valid password takes a user object that we've just stored and the password that, um, that, the, use, that the person who's saying that they're that user um, provided. So if I try to sign in as someone, that's the password I'll get. So we'll pass users, and I believe users here. Username and password um, that we were given from the API here. And if the password is valid, which means we, um, or if it's not valid, because instead of nesting, you could just do not um, return done invalid password. And we'll also say false. Otherwise, we actually got the user. And we did successfully sign in. So, 
And I could even console log that to make sure that we get that debug output. It's a whole lot of code I'm writing without running, so kind of makes me nervous, but we'll see. Okay. Um, and we'll just pass null here to say that we did not have an error. And instead of false, we'll pass in the user and username. Cool. So all this is actually in the passport documentation. This is not made up or whatever. It's actually in there. And then um, finally, we have to just, um, when passport is called, um, or when passport wants to serialize a user into a session or deserialize, it needs a unique identifier for that user. Um, so in the next section, we'll use the MongoDB IDs that we have. In this section, since we know that users will have unique usernames, we could just use the user, um, the username for the user object. So kind of a key value type of thing, where the username will serve as a key. Um, could you go back to the, your code real quick? Yeah. Um, how do you check? So, OK. So if the password is valid, then so the first thing we'll check for users' um, existence. Yep. The second is going to check for if the pa if the password is yep. not valid, and then the third you're going to check for. S and if both of those are true, then you're yep. already going to just go and sign in. Yep. And right? yep. So let me put some comments here. So uh, check if password is correct, and otherwise, if the user exists and the password is correct, then you should be able to sign in. All right. Okay. Um, and so now, uh, if we're past the, um, when Passport wants to serialize the user object into the session, um, we need to provide it um, what that key should be. So we're just going to, actually this is pre-baked in for us, so we're just going to uh, pass back to the done. Um, no error, uh, you're going to get the user ID back, or the username back. And password, Passport will use that. Now when Passport comes back and says, hey, I want to get a user out of the, um, if a user comes back that's already logged in, um, we want to be able to get that out of the session. So instead of not, we have not implemented this, we'll say no, we have. And instead, we'll do um, users, which is our database, our flow database, and we'll say username. And that'll return the user object back. Object back. And I'll put here tell passport which ID to use for user. OK. So now we have that part. Finally, we can actually start implementing our API. And I'm not going to torture everybody through this again with the gets and the, the posts and whatever. I have some pre-baked code that will just um, define all of our, the APIs that we need for authentication. And we could get right down to testing to see if it works. OK. So if I go back to our GitHub repository, and um, so I did the sign up, I did the login, the serialization, so the whole passport net. Um, finally, we can do the uh, um, this is initialized passport. We'll do that in a second. Um, I want the APIs. Actually, let me go ahead and do this now so that we can initialize passport in app.js. So we, we know that we created a passport in init.js, but we never actually used it or imported it. So we'll go ahead and do that. And I'm going to do it after the passport initializing passport session um, middlewares. And what this will do is we'll just call uh, the object. Um, it'll just require the, um, the file that we just made. And if you notice, we have this weird thing called module.exports. Module.exports in Node really just means that I have a Node module that I want to present. Module is the base. It's a global object within that file. And what we can do is we can, anything that we put on the exports object is what will be exposed when you require this thing. So you can think of it as public. And JavaScript is great because it allows us to do crazy things. So export, exports is actually just going to be a function within itself. And um, that allows us to actually call the module with the function and initialize the module. And what we'll do is we'll pass that module, the passport um, module, and um, it'll go ahead and initialize the passport library, and then we'll be good for the whole application. Um, OK. So let's see here. That's a whole lot of mouthful. So because we required init, init passport, init passport is, remember, it's a function that's been exported by the init passport init file. And we'll call init passport with the passport module that we required here. OK. Finally, we're going to implement our authentication API. And I believe I have another slide, and I think they're going to kill me if I don't break, start breaking some stuff up. So uh, we will have. Um, it's under adding authentication, but it's really the same thing. 
um, they're really going to kill me because I didn't separate anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so really what we're going to do is we're just going to add the APIs that we need around the Passport library that we just implemented, and we'll go ahead and test those out. All right, so to do that, I like I mentioned before, I have some, I'm you know, pre-baking some code here, uh, kind of like a cooking show. It's already coming out of the oven. Okay, so we have the similar idea. It's a little bit different than our previous implementation to where we just exposed the router object as the export. This time around, we're actually exporting the fu a function um, as the export, which just allows us to pass the passport uh, module around without having to like re-require it or things like that. So, and avoids having to use uh, globals and, and stuff. And it's quite nice. So um, this will actually uh, be the function, and instead of exp exporting the whole thing as a router, it'll just return a router, which also works because the express use um, function for routers expects to have a router object back, which will um, be compliant. So the first thing we'll do is we'll create, uh, let me start with these, with these first. These are pretty self-explanatory. We'll have the sign up API. So um, this will actually mount it at auth sign up, um, passport authenticate. And what this will do is we'll call the authenticate strategy of sign up, which we defined in that passport init file. And it'll either redirect the client to the uh, authentication success um, API or the auth uh, failure API. In this case, since there are static strings, we can't just say success and failure. We have to say auth slash success and auth slash failure. Otherwise, um, it'll just it'll mount, it'll route to the wrong API. Uh, we're going to do a similar thing here. We're going to call the login strategy with uh, the login API. And um, these will redirect to these little kind of like little dummy routes here, which will send us the same exact thing uh, no matter what you send it. So really, it'll say, hey, success and it'll be rec.user. The reason why we can do uh, rec.user is because that user is saved into the session, and automatically middleware just makes it magically happen to where the user will be deserialized out of that session. Um, same thing with failure. Uh, failure will, um, will just respond back to say, hey, the authentication failed. And what we'll just do, um, we're not going to get too fancy. We'll just assume that the user put the wrong username or password, and that's what the client will use to display the error message. OK. Um, finally, I think we, I need to comment out the authenticate require so we can actually pull the authentication file. And then we have to also uncomment the registration of that router to the auth um, endpoint. So remember that anything in the authentication router will start at auth slash sign in, auth slash log out, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So, Helen, are you ready to see this run? I'm very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> that did not sound confident. Um, of course, I didn't have a syntax error or anything, right? I mean, so there's actually a couple of people in the chat window with some with some syntax suggestions. Uh, yeah. So if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll go through it and tell you why people think that is so. Okay. So it looks like uh, yeah, it looks good so far. It most of it. I mean, the stuff that was executed, right? So let's see if we um, just make sure I don't crash or anything like that. Um, so we're going to grab our REST tester again. Oh, geez, where is it? There it is. And what we'll do is we'll do auth sign up, and it'll be a post. And um, instead of JSON, we're going to pass uh, form data. So username will be a set word. password, super duper secret. And we'll do x, yep, form encoded, we'll send. Oh, no, has no method authenticate. OK, so um, this is for um, income method has no message authenticate, which is, it looks like I'm doing rec.authenticate somewhere. The little one stuff doesn't work exactly right. I think it's uh, where am I calling rec.authenticate? Well, you're calling authenticate. Um, you're, so Stephen's calling authenticate in the authenticate JS. Uh, there are a couple people who think that the issue might be in the passport init. Yeah, it probably is. Let me look at the stack trace really quick. Uh, um, start routes. Oh, geez, this thing is. Okay, there we go. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so authenticate JS. Uh, 
Look, everybody's paying attention. Okay, I'll pick it to yes, uh, line 17. And we'll, it starts from there, right? So line 17, it does the post, which is great. This is what we expect, which is awesome because we're kind of teaching debugging right now too, right? Um, and let's see, it's router, express, middleware, blah, blah, blah. It's passport knit on this, this stack trace? Let's see. Um, I don't believe so. Huh, okay. But I think you're also applying the passport in itself to to passport. So now it's it should be on passport. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Where did I screw up here? Um, you passport. missed an S at the end of users. Someone said. Well, it, it won't. Can you search for user and then the square bracket? Yeah. There we go. Cool. Nice catch, but I don't think that was the error. No. There's a thing that's saying, hey, it doesn't have authenticate, which means that this would mean that the incoming message has no method authenticate, which means yeah. that I'm calling rec, because rec is the incoming message, mm -hmm. and authenticate means I'm calling authenticate on that. Um, yeah. Which would mean it's authenticate JS line seventeen, which is where we'd expect it. Um, uh, let's go. Let's go back to um, app. Oh yeah, yeah. actually, because yeah. it's part of the middleware. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. Um, so uh, where did we initial? We did initialize passport. Yeah, we and did. And are we? And then we? And then we're doing the authenticate. And so passport should have the authenticate piece. Yeah, it should have it there. Um, because we did session afterwards, mm -hmm. and we did initialize after the in the passport net. Um, and do we require a passport? We did. Do we? Did we require a passport local? Oh uh, yeah, we did. But we yeah. need to we need to require it and passport net, which is passport local. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, what we can do is because it's kind of complaining about um, it's really complaining about the. App.js setup. Like, I think that's what yeah. it's really complaining about. We can just, I can just fall back to the pre baked stuff if I can't figure this out in the next minute. Um, initialize, let me grab, let me go fall back to readme. Passport and net, app.js, somewhere here. Um, here. Okay, so here's our. Passport initialize, passport session, keyboard cat as our secret, whatever that is. Um, and we re require a passport, which should be the same as here. I don't think I misspelled anything. Um, authenticate, well, this is fine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the finished part of the module so we can see what we might have missed. Um, oh, I think that's what it is. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. There we go. All right. I'm sure everybody enjoys me sweating. OK. So uh, the reason why is because authenticate, remember, is exported as a module, which expects a function with a parameter. And because this is null, it's going to say, hey, um, this thing doesn't really exist. Um, so we do need to pass that over to it, which is passport. Anybody catch that in the chat? Yeah. Uh I can't tell if the person said it right when we said it or what, but we seem to have found it around right the, the same, same time. time. All right, let's try it again. Beautiful. OK. So now we have our um, password and my hash for the password. So notice that the password is actually not saved. OK. And um, get doesn't really do anything. Uh, if you do a, now we can do a login since I've already signed up. So I can actually um, log in with the same thing. And um, actually, let's go ahead and do the logout. Is the logout a post or is it a get? It is a. Logout say get. Yeah. Sign out. So sign out. And the cool part is, is that Passport adds these really nice, uh, what is it, get auth sign out. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, it's saying not found. Why? Well, I mean, if it's not in the pixel. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, 302. 
uh, 302 redirect, right? And because it's redirecting to the root, we don't, we don't actually have a root thing for that, so that's fine. So we get a 302 redirect, which means we did log out. When we do the application, that'll just mean that it'll redirect the user to the view. And if we do auth um, again, log in, we should be able to log in with uh, user super duper secret, which we do. And auth success is what you're, you're um, turned to, and we still have the same username and password. So everything's working fine. Um, we have our login. Now, finally, uh, we talked about middleware. We talked about all these magic functions that put stuff in between stuff. But now um, we're going to write our own middleware. And middleware is really useful if you want to do something, um, some type of action to a subset of APIs or subset of routes. Um, or all your routes. You have application level middleware, which is what we use, app.use, app.use, app.use. All that is application le level middleware, which means that any router, it applies to any router, any route, all of them. So it's kind of global. Um, what we want to do is, since we want to use the authentication piece for our API specifically, um, we just want to lock in, um, we want to lock up our app APIs. So um, our, our post APIs. So because, to do that, it's actually really simple. What we'll do is we'll say router.use function. Now, when you write middleware, middleware is super easy. All of this is really at, the, at its most basic form is a function that has access to request um, object, the response object, and the next object. Next means I'm going to call the next middleware in line between me and um, the request um, handler which means that the order of those, of those middlewares actually mattered because if middleware did something before and you weren't expecting that, then you might ruin the other middleware after it or vice versa. So um, let's do this. If, uh, and remember, uh, I didn't mention it, but the logout um, authentication API has this cool middleware because Passport adds it. Rec.logout is not something that comes with Express. It actually comes with Passport and it allows you to just do this logout thing. Um, so let's see here if we do if. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to do this very quickly. Um, if rec dot is, you know, I forgot if it's is logged in or um, what it is. Let me see really quick. I think uh, you made it is authenticated. Yeah, but the rec function actually has um, is authenticated. There we go. So rec has middleware is authenticated, and what we can do is we can just ask, hey, are you authenticated? And um, is that a function? Yeah. If it's not authenticated, what we'll just say is, hey, res.send message. Um, actually, we'll just do redirect to, and Helen will make this page eventually, um, but we'll do hash login. And um, so now, this will lock up any API that is on this route altogether. And really, uh, that's fine for this router, except we want to be able to allow those posts to be public and anybody to access those. So if we want to do that, we need to make the get for that completely open and um, excluded from the authentication. But every other method should, uh, modification methods and you know, new methods and such like that, those should require authentication. And the user sh any random user or any um, unauthenticated user shouldn't be able to access those. So what we'll have is if rec.method is equivalent to get, we'll just go ahead and do next, and we'll return. So what Steven's doing is he's basically ha um, Organizing this API so that it so that the GET request can be accessed by by any user, logged in or not. But for all the other routes, um, you have to be actually a logged in, authenticated user to be able to, for instance, uh, post mm -hmm. or or delete a post or whatever else. Okay. Here, uh, return res dot redirect. Uh, user not authenticated. Redirect to login page. And I believe that's all we want to do. And so this will actually enforce that. So now if I restart the server, we'll do this test very, very quickly so I could get, um, so we could go on our break. Um, so I've started it up. And now um, I'll go back to the rest tester. And I know it's not exactly sexy, but um, uh, this all matters because if you could test this without using the app, it'll save you a lot of time. So uh, first thing we'll do is we'll do a sign up. Remember, when we're, since this is in memory, when we, restart the server, we lose everything, which is why the database is important. So we'll sign up. Great. We signed up. We're authenticated now. And now if we go to um, API. Oh, shoot. You know what I should have done? Uh, let me do the negative test. So we'll negative test it, and we'll just try to do a post with a new 
new post on the post endpoint. And what we'll do is we get redirected to the login page. However, if I do a post, so we, we could tell that part works. So the middleware is working there. Now if we go to auth, let me make this a little bigger. There we go. Sign up. We're going to do a post again. Um, and we'll sign, we'll, we'll sign up. Great. I'm authenticated. Now I can go and create a post. So API post. And if I send, um, did I get a, OK? Looks like it's holding. It's, um, I might have done something here. Uh, if it's not authenticated, ah, yeah. Um, if it's not otherwise, res.next, or return next. User authenticated. Continue to next middleware or handler. OK, um, that was my mistake really quickly. Let me redo that one more time. So what we can see is that if I do um, sign up, so auth sign up, I'll do a post. We've logged in. We've authenticated. And now if I do API post, and I do a post to that, which is an authenticated only API, we'll get a response to do create new post. Awesome. So in our next module, what we'll do is we'll grab MongoDB, and um, we'll actually implement those, inter those uh, implementations for um, the to-dos of whether or not we need to create a new post, and store that in database, retrieve a new post, um, send all the post deck down to the client right from the database itself. And what we've done in this module is we've created all the routes that we need for the AngularJS front end, and we've also implemented the authentication that we need to protect certain APIs from unauthenticated users. Anything else, Alan? No, I think that's it. So we're going to go for a meal break, and we're going to be back uh, in an hour or so. Yep. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Yeah. See you. Welcome back to Microsoft Virtual Academy. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Means to hack jumpstart. Uh, my name is Steven. This is Helen. Hey guys. And um, so last time we left off, we had created a AngularJS front end for Chirp, our um, Twitter clone. And the last module, uh, I walked through Node.js and Express on how to create those APIs and get those things um, worked out for. Uh, mimicking how we would make post, and we actually did implement the authentication. So this module is all about the M of Beanstack, which is MongoDB. So um, MongoDB is our data store that we're going to use. So if you remember the last module, we actually went ahead and used an in-memory store, and that's just a temporary solution. So what we're going to do is actually swap that out with MongoDB. So for this module, we're going to talk about intro document-oriented databases. Um, just really a quick overview of that, um, what MongoDB is, how to use MongoDB from Node.js, which will flow right into how we can implement those route handlers for the post APIs to manipulate individual posts. OK. So um, first of all, so document-oriented databases uh, literally look like JSON objects. Um, this might be, um, this might be uh, kind of, kind of similar to if you would expect rows or um, columns in a traditional table or tabular data store and SQL databases. Instead, MongoDB just has documents. So uh, here's the documents that we'll actually be using for, um, for this actual application for Chirp. So we'll have user documents or post documents. User documents represent a user, and of course, post documents represent a cheap. And um, we'll use these as our um, structures in our data store. Now, we do have a full Microsoft Virtual Academy on document-oriented databases that you can go ahead and take a look at if you'd like to get more detailed information. Um, this module will more so talk about how to quickly use MongoDB to integrate it to our application to get things going very quickly. Um, so that's our document-oriented database, like, like 100 mile per hour um, overview. As that was very fast. There's a lot more to it. But, um, and now, so. MongoDB is a popular open source in, um, implementation 
of, uh, of, of a document oriented database. It's fully managed on Azure um, via Mongo Lab, which is a third party provider, which is just an add on in your Azure portal, which is really neat. That way you don't have to worry about um, like having to update MongoDB or any type of patches. It'll just kind of come down for you. And um, the drivers basically in most languages that people code in, there's a driver for it. There's a C++ driver, a Node.js driver, there's a Python driver, a C-sharp driver. Um, pretty much every um, every language I could think of has a driver for MongoDB. Yeah, and the great thing about the Mongo Lab instance for uh, on Azure is that you can actually use a small one for completely free, right? Yeah. So um, on, on Azure, you could actually spin up a Mongo Lab instance, um, and we'll do that on the last uh, module of the day when we tie everything up and launch it to the cloud. And um, we could you could have a free instance that actually doesn't cost anything. So with that, with a free website, you could get up and running for nothing on Azure, which is quite pretty nice. Okay, so uh, MongoDB comes with a few binaries that you should be aware of when you install. Um, it's the MongoDB, the database process. Uh, Mongo, the MongoDB uh, CLI, which is really just a, um, a way for us to manage our database. And Mongo Import, which is a data import utility. We only use the first two ones for this lab, but if you're interested in how to use like more of those Mongo utilities, go ahead and um, take a look at our on-demand uh, MongoDB jumpstart. Um, that we filmed in last January, and I believe went live um, for on demand in um, last month. Okay, so we talked about MongoDB document or data databases. So now, how do we use MongoDB from Node.js to, um, you know, because we need to do that if we're going to implement those route handlers. So the first thing we're going to do is, um, so you can either decide to use the ODM, which is an object data mapper, or we can just use MongoDB driver by itself. Um, the object data mapper is pretty nice because it wraps up MongoDB and it actually enforces schemas. You might be familiar with SQL. If you are, uh, SQL kind of naturally enforces a schema. MongoDB does not, which is one of the great things about it. But it's also a double-edged sword because if you're not actually um, enforcing any type of schemas, things can go crazy because you could just put whatever. And um, documents don't necessarily have to look like each other. It's just by convention you keep those. So Mongoose actually um, enforces those conventions for you. And you'll see what I mean in a bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just do an npm install mongoose, and we'll save that to our package JSON, and that'll allow us to go ahead and start using um, MongoDB. So I'll jump into uh, my, my command line and actually go ahead and do that. Um, so I already have our module for start directory open in our GitHub repository. So I'll do npm install mongoose. So mongoose has a dependency on a MongoDB um, library. So uh, if you see here, so we don't actually need to download the driver because Mongoose just uses the driver um, under it. Um, so that's actually pretty nice. OK, so um, we've installed it, and we're kind of ready to go. If we want to go ahead and require it, we can go ahead and put it in our um, app.js, which is var uh, mongoose equals require. Mongoose, and um, we'll connect to MongoDB. Let me make sure I'm following my slides here. Yeah, so uh, with the MongoDB driver, uh, we don't really need to talk about it too much. You can use it directly, but we'll just use the driver through Mongoose. And it allows us to create, modify, and delete, and insert, you know, CRUD operations on, on records. So um, to connect to MongoDB, we'll just connect to a local MongoDB server, which will be um, what is it? Uh, Mongo DB localhost. Hmm. I think you'll need to do mongoose.connect to connect. Oh, um, connect, yeah. Hmm. There we go. Mongo DB. Uh, what's the port number, Helen? Let's do some 102. Uh, the default port. Something number? like that, yeah. Let me, I'll check in a second. And then we'll pick the date, name of the database we're going to use. So we'll call it uh, chirp test. Okay, so ooh. so this uh, this connects us to our MongoDB database, which we'll be running locally. Now, the thing you might ask is, hey, how do I you know get MongoDB running? So to do that, uh, after you install MongoDB, depending on where you installed it, um, it's actually set up on my path variable. Um, so wherever you installed it, just go MongoD. And if you start it for the first time, it will complain about the data directory. So you might have to um, place the data directory where it asked for. You can also just do um, mongo d and do db path, path to data directory. 
and which, which is just where MongoDB will store its, its uh, on this data. But if I have everything set up, I can just do MongoD. Um, let's see. Oh, I think another data database is actually running already. Yeah, this crazy looking screen. There we go. Okay, so it says, hey, waiting for connections on port 27017, which is the default MongoDB port. So 27017. 017. Thank you. Okay, so now we've connected to, um, this will connect us to our MongoDB server. So now we're kind of set up to use MongoDB with Node. And um, what we'll do with the um, Mongoose ODM is that uh, it'll enforce schemas around our MongoDB database using um, schemas, and then the schemas will, uh, will be able to use models. And the way it works is that MongoDB has collections. Documents go into collections, and collections go into databases. Databases live on servers. And um, so at, for every model there's, or a schema, there's a one-to-one -one, um, relationship between a model and a um, collection. So if I have a post model, I'll have a post plural collection. If I have a um, if I have a user model, I'll have a user's collection. So that's kind of how that works. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about how we can implement the route handler with uh, um, how we can implement the route handlers with um, Node.js and and MongoDB. So if you remember from the previous lab, we actually just did a quick um, to do implementation. We never actually implemented everything. Now we're actually going to um, get the user documents for a GET request and create a user document for POST request. So really, it just means, hey, if we want to create the CRUD um, operations on those APIs that we didn't implement before. So we got the authentication working, but now we need to do the implementation. So we'll go ahead and get started. So um, let me minimize this out. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually jump into our Authenticate.js uh, here. Let me pull up my um, GitHub repository for it so I could follow my README. So if we go to chirp, module four. So uh, we already started MongoDB and we already installed uh, Mongoose. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and create our models uh, JS and we're going to um, use models JS to create our schemas. So uh, I'm going to create a new folder here, we'll call it models. And say we create a new file here, we'll call it um, models.js. Now, you, you don't have to follow this, this um, convention. You can make a model folder, a model file for each type of model you want to hold. Because we only have two, I'm just going to throw them in the same one. So first we'll do mongoose equals require mongoose here. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Afterwards, we'll go. Um, so we got our mongoose, uh, uh, our mongoose uh, require module in. So now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and create a. Um, we want to create a um, schema here. So mongoose schema. <laughs> uh, I'm being yelled at for typing too loud, so I'm going to type. I'm going to type a, a little bit quieter for you guys. Sorry about that. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to create a schema, and the schema will have a username and password, and um, I, I guess it created that too. So what we'll do is let me go back, um, and we'll call this. I'm actually going to copy and paste code because I don't actually remember memorized uh, the mongoose schema stuff. OK. So um, we're going to create a, new, a user schema, and the user schema will be um, have a username, password. And the thing is, when we create a schema, we define what the types are for each field. And we have created that, which is a um, of type date. And when we create a new one, um, the default value will be now, unless uh, specified by um, the thing that saves the, the model. We're also going to have one more model, which, called, which is called the post schema, which will be a new mongoose schema. And the username will be, nope, not schema, uh, post schema. So it'll be text and it'll be type string. We'll also have created by, how long, what is it going to be? Is it going to uh, be type string? or Yeah, could you make it a type string? OK. So it'll be created by, and it'll be a string that will point to the, uh, the user ID that created it. And we'll have created at, 
Um, actually, I don't think I need created at. I just think I need. Um, is that all you need, Helen? Uh, I t well, the created at would have a timestamp for the post, so ah. we do want that. Okay. There we go. Boom. Okay, so now we have our schemas. Now um, Mongoose wants us to create um, the final thing to do when we're using Mongoose is just to synthesize. Synthes bleh, synthesize <laughs> our models. And um, so it's really easy to synth synthesize a model. Um, all we have to do is uh, do um, mongoose model post mongoose model user, and that'll allow us to um, just to export, kind of export those modules into mongoose so that they could be used by anybody using the mongoose module in the application. So mongoose uh, user. And it'll be dot model. Yeah. All right. And we'll do the user schema, which means I'm declaring a model. So I'll put that. Declare a model called user, which has schema user schema. So now remember, MongoDB under the covers really has no um, concept of a schema. It really is schemaless. So you can do whatever you want, which is great, because you can change things in the future. But it's also good practice to kind of um, have some sanity onto what that data object's going to look like so that you have some consistency through your database. If you need to add something or move something, it's pretty flexible. But um, it, it allows you to actually declaratively describe what things look like. And once you're done with that, can you actually do me one more favor? I'm the person that's going to consume a lot of these. So it, so I, I do want what we're doing to align. Uh, could you use a username instead of created by for the uh, user schema? Yep. Thank you. You got it. There you go. So text username. Um, and we'll do our post model and our post schema. And same thing here. Uh, it'll be a model called user, which has schema. Um, User schema, same thing, model called post, called uh, using post schema. OK. So we've created that. We can require that in. So I'll do that. We could do it right after mongoose connect. We could do require. And we don't really need to hold on to the, mon uh, the model's um, module. Uh, we don't really need to, but we can if we wanted to. So we'll do models models.js, OK? Now, this require uh, will actually start to execute whatever's in models.js. I don't think we actually export anything, so it'll just um, be within the mongoose library itself. OK? And um, so now we've actually created our basic connection to, to MongoDB with the, the schemas that we want to do. Now, um, the exciting part really is adding the users, um, getting the users uh, out of like the in-memory nonsense that we're doing with the users, yeah. as well as the post um, as well. So the first thing we'll do is we'll implement the users in MongoDB because we need users to actually create posts. So it makes sense to start there. So to do that, uh, if you remember that Passport init had this pesky little users data store, so we'll get rid of that, and we'll actually start to use MongoDB instead. So we'll do mongoose equals require mongoose. And then we'll say users um, equals mongoose.model. Oh, is that right? Um, where yeah. are you doing that? Um, when I grab the models, let me see. Should be. I think so. Yeah. Mongoose model. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm saying. If we catch it here earlier, then you know I don't have stuff blowing it in my face later. <laughs> <laughs> Post. Um, so all this, by the way, if you just look at the Mongoose documentation, you just do a quick search. It's really easy. Um, you'll find you'll find it's all documented. So because we um, required and initialized Mongoose before we actually loaded this, which let me double check that we did. If not, um, things will kind of go haywire. Uh, so we have Mongoose require. So what we should actually do is we should require it after we do passport init, which would make sense to do it here. Um, before it. So do it right before. 
So actually, it doesn't matter. We could do it here. We could do it on the top. Yeah, I think you're okay wherever. Yeah, I'm okay, whatever. As long as it's not after Passport Net, because then Passport wouldn't have any type of users um, declared um, otherwise. Okay. So we've created that. And um, so now that we have our users and we have our posts, we can actually start manipulating some stuff. So if we want to actually create a... Um, Are you looking for the authentic? No, I'm okay. not looking for anything. I'm good. So uh, sign up here. So instead now, uh, wherever we see users bracket, that was our old database, our in-memory stuff, and now we're going to actually use it for um, use MongoDB. So we'll do users, or user. I really should call it users. Uh, yeah, we'll call it users. <laughs> yeah. It might be different in the end module. I forgot what we called it uh, on our final version. But um, we'll say users.find1. So find one is a method, which is just a convenience method. It's actually on the raw MongoDB library as well. And really, it just, it's a convenience to find a document which matches um, the first one that matches the query. And the queries in MongoDB are described by, um, by query objects and not by actual queries. Um, like SQL queries, it's just an object, which is a query object. And that's just what it is. And it describes the type of object we're looking for. So, in this case, we're looking for an object, um, a user object with username equal to the username that we're passed in by Passport. Okay. And what it'll do is it'll um, will give us a callback, or the call callback, and we'll give it to it. Um, the first argument, remember, in a callback in Node.js is usually an error, um, and then afterwards it's a um, it's the, actually the document. So. I will call it the user object. Okay, and let me. There we go. Beautiful. So now, um, if we got an error, we can say. Um, so either way, we need to call this callback to tell the function that we're done. So we'll do return done, and we'll say um, db error, and we can pass this to error, and we could say. Um, and we could actually just pass it directly. And other, otherwise, we'll just do false because we did actually did not find the signup request failed because there's something off the database. Um, otherwise, uh, if user, so if we did find a user, that means that um, we have, we have uh, already signed this user up. Meaning that this user, this sign up request should fail because this username is already taken. Okay? Cool. So now that the username is already taken, it's false. Um, we've already, we've hit those two, those, uh, two possibilities. So uh, user already exists with username. It's the same, it's the same uh, leg of code, so we can delete that. And finally, um, we want to store the user in the, instead of in memory in the database. So what we'll do is we'll say, um, Bar user equals, um, let's see, uh, user name, username. And the same thing before is what we did. We just create the hash with the password. Um, we'll just do the same thing here. Get rid of that. There we go. And finally, we'll do users. Dot, um, can I just do a save on that object, or do I need to? You can do a save. Yeah, you can do a save on. Well, you can do. You can work? do a save on not users, but your actual user. Ah, uh, so yeah. So the new user that you created. The user I created, right? Yep. User dot save. Um, and. Hmm. But did you? Um, sorry, did you? But you need to probably make your user a new user. Yeah, that's true. Okay, yeah. got it. That's why I was like, huh, this is weird. Yeah, no, I remember now. New. Um, and so user is actually a, a constructor. So. Oh, oh, oh. Had some sublime craziness going on there. Let me find myself again. Oh, there we go. And I think I declared it as users, which is kind of um, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny looking, right? Um, and let me double check. I have to uh, always fact check myself. Um, new user. Cool. Yeah. So in the example in README, you'd see user, but. In our case, we'll just do that. And then we'll just call new user, and then we'll just add those, those fields as necessary. So instead of doing that, we'll just do users. And although it looks funny, this is just a user model. 
and we're making a user object. Maybe I should just change it back to user. <laughs> I think I'm going to do that. You did it for a reason before, right? I know. I did it for a reason before. I don't want to confuse everybody. So we'll just do post. User and post. Okay. And then um, we'll go back to sign up. And instead of users, we'll do user.find one and uh, equals new user. And then finally, uh, user.username will equal username. User.password will equal the create hash password. And then afterwards, we have everything in a MongoDB savable or mongoose savable object. And then all we have to do is just call save on it. Now, we don't have to listen to the callback, but we should. So um, or does it tell me the count, or does it just return me the user back? I forgot. Uh, I don't think it returns. Anything. I believe it actually returns you the entire user. That's what I thought. OK. So um, if error return done with error um, false. Otherwise, um, so log successfully signed up user. User name. Cool. And then return done. Null, which means we don't have an error. And we'll pass back the user, which is user. Um, so do you want to do user.username for const successfully signed up user? I don't think so. I think we pass the whole user. And then um, uh, afterwards, we, we serialize the usernames for serializing in and out of the session. So uh, that, I think that should be right. OK. OK. Um, so now we create a sign up API. And so now we got to make the login API. Um, again, we can't use the user's uh, in memory thing. So I, I actually could, should cut this out. Yeah, see, we passed user to username, remember before, which is the whole object. Um, and kill this. All right, perfect. So now um, we have uh, our done. And now we'll just do the login really quick. So the same idea here. First, we check to see if the user exists. If the user already exists, our, um, actually, this should be if not user found. But if the user doesn't exist, false. If the password is not valid, <laughs> false, um, then you shouldn't be able to log in. Otherwise, um, oh, and this one's if it is valid. But if, it is, if the password is valid, then we'll check. And if it is valid, we'll just go ahead and return. So we'll follow the same logic here, except we'll use the user, um, the MongoDB object instead. So first thing we'll do is um, user.find1. And we're going to use our user name as the search for the query. And um, so these queries are really interesting because they're basically JSON objects, which is really neat. Um, error, which is an error from MongoDB. Otherwise, we have a um, user that we should get back, so just one. And um, so now what, what we basically need to do is check if uh, we got an error. If we got an error from MongoDB, then return the done callback with just, let me make this a little bigger for you guys, with the error of the, of the database and um, false, which just means that we didn't, we're not going to log in. Otherwise, if uh, the user, if there is no user object that came back, so if this is null, that means that there is no user with this username. So if there is no user with this username, that means that you shouldn't be able to log in. So you should also return done, error, um, not error, but uh, user username not found. Okay. And then we'll do false again. You should be able to log in. Finally, uh, we have to check to see if the password's correct. There's a lot of cases here, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, if the password is not correct, is a password is not true. And what we have to do is we have to pass the user object, which we got at this point, and the password that uh, is attempted to be used for this user. Um, if that user, if that password is is not valid, then um, wrong password. We'll return done. Um, incorrect password. Incorrect password. Thank you. And false. 
All right, I feel really negative because these are all the reasons why you shouldn't be able to log in, right? I mean, that's what makes this semi-secure as an application. Yeah. I'm not going to say it's the most secure, but yeah, it's but not it's, bad. Yeah, it's not bad. It's good enough. <laughs> all right, so finally, we need to do uh, let the user actually um, log in. And um, so to do that, we'll just simply just do return done um, with null, which means, hey, everything's A-OK. -okay and the actual user object. And that's about it. So now we'll delete the, the in-memory implementation. So now we should be able to log in and we should be able to sign up. And um, finally, what we need to do is we need to serialize and deserialize the user. Uh, to do that, uh, again, you could see that uh, we have the passport serialized user, which remember, wants us to, which will provide us with the user object and wants us to provide a key for that user. So. In our case, we'll just do underscore ID. Um, I know that looks like magic. What happens is MongoDB gives us an ID already on every object, which it generates for us, which we know to be unique. So because of that, we might as well use that for the serialization, um, because we know for um, with high certainty that that is going to be um, a unique ID. Um, and what we'll do is we'll return user dot underscore ID. And we should put a return before every callback, just in case. It's good practice. And then um, on the deserialized user, we need to find the user based on the user ID given. So uh, what we can do is we can just do user dot find by ID. Oh, do we just pass the ID to it? I, I forgot. You pass um, that, yeah, you pass just the ID. OK. So we'll or do. Or in this case, it's the username, since oh. that's what you're, oh, yeah. ID. You just need ID. <laughs> like magic. OK, so now we have the ID that we're going to, this ID is going to come back to us because we provided the ID on the serial and the serialized uh, part of this. So our ID comes back to us, which is our MongoDB ID. And what we can do is we just do function, again, er for error, and um, the user, which is the, docu the user document coming from MongoDB. And we're going to do a return. Um, well, if there's an error, it is going to return the done handler with a null. And we'll also, actually not null, sorry, uh, error, to say, hey, we got an error and false. Otherwise, um, return user. Well, also, just in case, I'm not sure if the mongoose returns a, uh, a null, an error, if they can't find it. But we'll say, if not user, return done, user not found, false. Finally, Otherwise, we will do return done user. Um, we'll say true, and we got return the user. Cool. And boom. OK, so now um, we found the user. Provide it back to Passport. So now everything's actually really asynchronous because we have to actually go off to the server and fetch that data and bring it down. As before, it was in, in memory, so there was no asynchronousness because it was right in the application. OK. So now all of this is implemented. We should be able to log in, log out, um, similarly like we did before, but those users will persist. So let's test it out. Um, if we go over to our advanced REST client, I'm trying to see if I have a break slide. No? OK, cool. This is all the same thing. All right, so let me go to off. And I probably should run the application. Let's see if it actually works. So npm start. I uh, can't find module debug. Did I do a npm install here? I did. Sometimes I see that, and um, I thought that was in the package JSON. Or it came with Express. Um, OK. Debug. So I'm installing the debug module. Ah, OK. No, this isn't installed, because all that stuff comes in the express package JSON. OK. There we go. So let's give this a shot. We'll do localhost auth um, sign up. So if all goes well, we should see a new user in the database. And everything always works the first time. see here. 
We should be connected to the local database. Um, did we actually ever connect? Oh, I don't think we ever connected. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we did. Let me double check our MongoDB connection. Localhost 27017. Um, the port's listening to 27017. Um, our mongoose. Hmm. Okay, let me look at my finish really quick. Let's look at Notepad. Yeah. Oh. Okay. It actually doesn't even specify the port, so I think by using the default, but it should. That shouldn't really matter, though. We could try it anyways. Is the app running? Why don't you check if it's connecting to the server, or to the MongoDB server now? Yeah, see, I'm not seeing any connections. Huh. What is going on here? Like always, worst case is fall back onto the, the cloud version, but or the cloud uh, MongoDB server, but we should be able to connect to it. And it says, oh, someone said you missed a call to done one time, but okay, no, that's not. That shouldn't matter. That, yeah, that's not our current issue, but we will go and fix that. Yeah, but look. Yeah, um, you're, connect you're connecting to the MongoDB server. Yeah, um, unless I'm not in the right directory, module 4, start FGS, module 4, start, start yeah. FGS, yeah. And we don't see a connection when we start, which I would have failed, I would expect to fail if we didn't find a connection. Uh, let me double check here. Okay. So what we can do is we can, oh. Oh. Whoa, that was weird, right? Yeah. It says, oh, all these connections are now open. Huh. Well. Yeah, and now it can't connect. That's weird. That might be a little Windows thing. Let's try it again. Mongo D. Waiting for connections. It might be like I paused it on the command line. Okay, connection accepted now. All right, that works. And then the, now the done handler, um, someone mentioned it was a done handler error, but I don't think that's an issue. Let me see. Uh, if we go back, uh, our passport init, return done, return done, and we're trying to do sign up, right? Uh, yes. So you find, find one username, fair, fair, ah, so user name, hmm. ah, no, user save should work too. Yeah. I might have to Martha Stewart it, let's see. I'm going to do one debug line. If I could see the, uh, if I could see a debug line, then we'll do that. If not, we'll fall back to the pre-raid version. We'll see what we did wrong. Okay, uh, quickly run. Let's see. Call the API one more time. Yeah, I don't have an output from it. Which, it's probably because maybe something's not registered or something. I'm not exactly sure. Which is fine. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll look at this really quick. Open folder. Okay. Passport init. So this is basically the same thing. We're taking the user, we're gonna save it um, with the same implementation. We're gonna um, save the user and we'll see if the registration was successful. So um, just a copy and paste, it should be the same compatibility. Oh, you know what? Did I do? Yeah, no, we did the same thing. So that should still work. Let's try it again. Here we go. Oh, this is weird. It's not even responding. Huh. I will check the app JS really quick. Um, authenticate. Authenticate. Hmm. Well, that doesn't make much sense to me. I'm gonna try it one more time, and I'm gonna do the. Um, I'm just gonna go to the finish. Okay, 
and do npm install. Install our modules. Quick, quick, quick. Come on. There we go. npm start. There we go. Cool. All right, so we got some response. It's kind of strange that the uh, um, that the that I couldn't even do a sign up those, which is really weird. Okay, so when we do a sign up, uh, we should get the um, so we're, we're getting a um, what you call an un invalid user name or error, which is uh, probably because we have um, a database error. So this is running. Hmm. Oh, user already exists, that's that word. Okay, that's fine. So uh, because the user already existed, so I could just pick a new data, uh, new name. So instead of that, we'll just pick sword 8172 Huh, ah, and it's not responding now. The uh, um, we're saving the user here, hmm. but everybody loves watching me sweat. Give me, let me, let me see here. So we did the the sign up, and it said, "Hey, user already exists." So uh, that already means that we got a user when we did the find one. So otherwise, uh, if there's no user, we should create the user um, username, password, create the hash. We save the ha uh, the user, and uh, it should just tell us either we're, we're not we're saving it. So um, we can do just a bit of debugging here and say, hey, if it already exists, um, which already hit that path, otherwise, um, should create creating a new user and should create the new user here. Uh, user. And we'll call it username. Cool. And um, so now this should tell us whether or not we're creating a new user or not. We could tell if we actually um, hit an error or not. Uh, Saving the um, same new user object. Restart the server. Oh, that's really strange too. I see that registration successful. Yeah. These PowerShell windows are kind of weird because. Well, if the registration is successful, what is your what is the response that you're getting? Um, well, now I got the response and it was hey success. It was really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I don't know. Sometimes the uh, PowerShell windows like they'll. I think when I do this actually, I think this is the issue. It, it pauses it. I'm not sure. Okay. So I can do another user. I'll do SEDWAR 171722 and let's see if I got a response here. Ah, you know, that's really crazy. I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, um, it's yeah. redirecting you to success. Yeah, yeah that's great. okay. So we got 302, so we're fine. So now um, what we can do is if you want to look at the actual database and see the, obje the, the users in it, um, we can do a, another PowerShell. We could just go to Mongo. And we could do something very quick. We could look at the actual database. Ah, yeah, see that? Like, yeah, so strange. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm just not going to touch this window. It keeps freezing up my, um, and that could be doing it to the server too. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so connecting the test, we can sh show DBs. We can see all the databases we want. Remember, we, have a, we made a test chirp database, which is here. So we'll do uh, use um, test chirp. Okay. Now I can do show collections, and we'll see that we have a users collection, which is what we created before, um, which is based on the users model. And we'll just do, um, uh, let's see, uh, db.users.find. And this will show us all the users that we've created. We could pick like the first one. And we could see that this is in the database, username 172, password, whatever is the hash. Cool. So we're saving our users now. I'm going to copy this over to our, since my handwriting, my hand coding seemed like it failed. I'm not too sure if it failed or if that was the MongoDB server. But let's quickly go ahead and do the um, API authentication. So now that we have the, uh, or the post APIs, so we've already created We've implemented all the API, um, the authentication APIs with the MongoDB database, saving users, pulling them out, et cetera. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and implement the POST APIs to manipulate the POST objects. We already have the authentication of those APIs already from the last module. So now all we're going to do is we're just going to um, put the MongoDB nest in there, MongoDB eyes it, um, <laughs> and then we should be good to go. So uh, the first thing we'll do is, and this is the um, start. So remember that we did the is authentication authenticated. We protected certain APIs that we needed to. And now we're actually going to fill out these two do's. So what we're going to do first is we need to grab the mongoose uh, module. Mongoose equals require mongoose. OK. OK. And then um, var post equals, which is our post model. And we'll do mongoose.model post. Beautiful. OK. So now, um, what we need to do is we need to grab uh, for, well, we'll do the get because it's really easy. So we'll do the get, we'll say post.find and um, function error data. OK, so what does this do? Um, so we had find one, and we also have find. Find optionally takes a query parameter. If you don't pass a query object to it, it's just going to return everything in that collection. And um, the actual data object's actually call, um, a cursor. So if you have a, a large amount of stuff, it'll just cursor through the database. And um, we could use that and return that right to our client. So to do that, we will do uh, if error. We could just return like res.send. We can send a 500 error. Let's say message. Um, DB error. Actually, we, we can just put the. We can just pass the raw error to it. You might not want to do that because it's leaking. You're leaking um, diagnostics information. But I'm just going to throw it in there for time's sake. Uh, we'll return. So we should always return when we call our callbacks. Otherwise, um, we'll return res. Is it JSON or send? I don't think it matters, right? Send. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And we'll, we'll send the data back down. So what this will do is it'll send actually a collection of posts that we have in our database. And uh, that will allow Helen to actually comp uh, comp consume that in AngularJS and show the, our, our cheats. Um, now we got to actually implement the thing that will create a new post, which will, um, which is the post endpoint, the post method, and the post endpoint. And what we'll do here is we'll do post, the same idea here, except it's not going to be find. It's going to be a, can we just do an insert? I'm pretty sure we could do that too. I don't know, I'm not sure if that was our final implementation though. Um, post insert. Uh, I'm going to double check myself because I don't want to go off the paths here. Uh, let's see. We've already serialized. We created all the authentication. We're going to do API post. And we're going to say um, if we want to create a new post, we just um, actually, yeah, this is for new post. So we create a new post, uh, and I'll just copy and paste this because I am in a rush. So we have four minutes left. All right, um, here. So now, instead of uh, using the, the to-do or whatever we had, we're going to create a new post object. The post text is going to be the text and the request body. So it's going to do a post, and we're going to get the text out of the text body, and that's what we're going to shove into the MongoDB database. Afterwards, we're going to have the created by, which will actually, I think Helen wants me to change created by to username. And um, afterwards, we'll, um, we'll save it off into the database, and everything will be right with the world. So username here. Helen, are you calling the username on the request body? Uh, I believe I am. OK. So this is coming right from Angular, the Angular client. So that's why um, it's important. Actually, no, it's, it's created by. I'm created sorry. by? Yeah. And you want me to save it here as created by or as username? Uh, you should, I think saving it as username. I, d okay. I don't know what I called it in mind, to be honest. <laughs> but. Excellent. OK, cool. That's fine. And then um, so now we've then created by with the text, and we'll now we'll just return the post object. And um, so this is the returning the post object that we've created. doesn't really matter. The client can do whatever he wants with it. Um, and the post in here will actually save, the, save this into the database. So we have that. And then finally, um, we need to um, do our particular post. So uh, I don't think this actually will actually use this on our front end client explicitly. But I believe Angular does look for these endpoints. So uh, we should provide them. So uh, in order to do that, it's really simple. Um, for each one, we're going to use the ID. The ID is going to be the same ID that we use in MongoDB, and that'll just be what we have on. Um, what we'll, we'll use the MongoDB ID for the 
ID part of the URL. So we have this, and then we have um, get specified post. So this will just get a post for a sp specific ID. Uh, I want to replace it for this one here. We have our put route, which is what we had before, but instead we need to um, modify an existing post. So again, this is right through our readme. Uh, the put's a little bit longer because what we need to do, we need to find, uh, find the post that uh, we want to actually modify and then modify it itself. So um, if you look, we have find by ID first, which is the ID of what we want to look for. The error, um, we return an error if we don't have it or not. Um, again, this username, not, um, you're doing created by, right? Uh, yes, in my, okay. in my request body, yes. Okay, cool. And then um, post the post text, and then what we'll do is we'll save that. If we don't find that username, then obviously we can't actually upgrade it, update it, so that's why we return an error. So I have to do two actions here for the put, which is why um, it's a little bit bigger than they get. And then finally, the delete, which is really just removing something from the database, um, which is just a dot remove function on the model. And there we go. Um, so now all that's been implemented. So now our post, um, our post API is allegedly completely implemented with MongoDB, and it'll actually allow us to get and put and put stuff in the database. Now um, let's go ahead and give it a try and put my money where my mouth is and actually get um, everything working here. So we're gonna run our server again. Okay. So oh, this isn't our finish, but it should be the same thing. And we'll go to the advanced REST client here and we'll test. So we'll do a sign up or maybe assign a login because we have the same MongoDB database now. So everything is persistent. So we'll do auth login. Make sure MongoDB is running. Okay. Oh, man. Hmm. You know what we can do? I might just hit the live endpoint because I'm not sure what's happening on my machine with Mongo, but it just seems like it's hanging for some reason. So we'll hit the live app's your website. So we'll go HTTP chirp MVA, the Azure websites. And we'll do uh, off. And I don't know. I'm just going to create a new user. So we'll do post, add a new value here. Username is equal to Steve. Hit eight. We'll add a new username, uh, password, which is password. And we'll do post. Yeah, post uh, sign up, right? Yeah, post sign up. Huh. It's doing the same thing. Huh. That's really it's weird. strange. Because the, the live app actually works, right? The, the live site definitely is working. OK, well, it's going to have to work at some point because you're going to integrate to it. Um, yeah, not sure why. Uh, it's, it should just work. Uh, I, I think it's hanging on that connection. but. Uh, it's weird that the live the live site does that, and I'm pretty sure you could just sign in. Yeah, so, I'm, I just registered right now on the live site. Yeah, I don't know. It might be this, the advanced rest client. We'll figure it out um, during the break, though. It's not a big deal. So, um, anyways, so we've created our we've MongoDBized our APIs by having our um, our MongoDB uh, instances actually create our um, create our users and create our posts. And we are able to return all those posts back down. And in the next section, what we're going to do is we're going to consume these APIs right from AngularJS. And what that'll do is it'll just create a quick little integration so we can actually do two-way binding on the front end. And that binding will actually integrate to the MongoDB database on the back end. So if you restart the server or if you do something else, it just kind of works. And all the, the cheats and all that will just be saved persistently um, between application restarts. Cool. So we'll see you back in a bit. Yeah, see you back soon. And 
we're back. So welcome to module five, which is uh, tying up our application back together with uh, MongoDB, or sorry, with uh, AngularJS and our Express backend. So we're putting everything together in this one, right? That's right. And uh, let's just take a couple of moments to actually go through and make those API calls and get a reminder what the backend looks like. Yeah, so in the last module, I guess we didn't actually fully uh, get working this little error on our box. Um, so if you just look at my box really quick, you'll see that we can create a uh, request to our local host API. This is all backed by MongoDB. It's the same implementation we had before. There's actually no functional difference. It's just the, the application is hanging on the console. So uh, here we can grab the API post. We're already authenticated. So we just simply do a application JSON post with a text field of like, this is a cheap, and your username that you're actually tweeting for. And we can just do like, this is a cheap too, for example send that, we get a response of the object that we sent, which was, hey, this is API cheap number two. And if we do a get, we'll get all the cheaps that are in the database, which is, see, this is API cheap, this is API cheap two. And um, we know the user that cheaped for it, so we can actually front that with the front end database. And we could start tying everything together. Um, so pretty exciting, right? Yeah, it is. So let's start off by actually uh, putting in our Angular views, uh, putting our Angular views, that's right, into actually our server. So we're going to go in and we're going to actually go through to this module five start folder. So this will, is pretty much what Steven left us off with last time uh, with, with some minor changes that I'm going to show you now. So in the beginning of the module, Steven actually went through and, sorry, I'm gonna close all of these so you're not distracted by them. And so Stephen actually went through in the beginning of this module, and he, this is module two. I want module five. I'm just going to minimize these. Um, he, del he went through and he actually deleted the, the routes.index here and also this. Um, I just went back and I added in one tiny route. I kept it separate from his you know, to keep things pretty clearly delineated. And what it basically does is uh, it gets our home page at just basically the root. How does it know that it should use that route? Um, like when it start when we start up the application. Well, when we start up that, uh, you mean when we're starting up the application? How does it how does it know to basically go to here? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, you'll see in our app.js that we're basically saying, or so we're you know routing this like we're routing anything else that we've done before, except all we're doing is we're saying, hey, uh, you know, just go to this. Thing here. Oh, so because it's at the root. Exactly. So if I go to www.awesomechirpapp.com, yeah, then this I'll is, just, that's where it'll look. Yeah, exactly. And all we're doing is we're saying, hey, if you just, you're going to the root, so you'll notice we don't have any, um, any sort of parameters either side of that, then we'll just automatically get this index.ejs that we have in our views folder. And that's something, well, that's something we're in the completed folder. We want to be in the start folder. And that's something that is just, um, I just generated, it's a really plain HTML page. So right now, if we actually go through and we run our application with npm start, we can go to our localhost 3000 and it'll just it's display that tiny hello page. So in this case, we're just making like at first, an extremely simple front end that just says nothing except hello, and it's, as you could tell, not actually an Angular app. Now we're actually going to start porting over sort of our Angular features in. And before we start doing that, we're going to make something, we're going to make a single page application. So when we last left off, um, I'm going to now go into our just module two. Uh, we had a couple of folders. We had, you know, the, the login folder, we had a login page, a main page, and a register at that HTML. And all we're going to do right now is we're going to start pulling these in to our, uh, our other app. Oh, I'm also in the wrong folder here. I started hesitating because I was like, this is not what That's I left off with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, OK. So here. Um, so we left off with this. And we actually left off with some, you know, just nice but separate pages. And now what we want to do is we want to make them into a single page application. You can again follow along in the, the readme for module five. Or actually, no, this, this was back in module two because we're still leaving off with the single page application stuff. So if you get confused like I just did uh, and you want to know more about the, single uh, the routing and creating a single page application, go to the end of module two.
so we didn't finish up what we needed in module two. So we're finishing up just a single page part and continuing with the routing uh, yeah. and putting everything together. Yeah, exactly. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to do some of that front end routing. And we're going to start creating an app with multiple views. In order to do that, we're going to use the ng route module. And we're going to basically detect the URL that a user is on and display an appropriate template on the page without actually navigating. Although it look, it'll look like we're navigating because it'll change the URL on the page. So the first thing we need to do is actually to create some partials of the page. So whereas before we had three separate pages uh, that we'd render separately, and they all had to you know, call out and get the JavaScript sources and the CSS style sheets, now we're only going to make a tiny partial of the page that only contains basically the snippet of that page that is the most relevant and does that purpose. So for the login registration pages, for example, that would just be purely the form and uh, nothing else. So let's actually go through and create our partials. Creating partials is actually you know, pretty simple because all you're doing is you're stripping away the stuff that you have. So I'm actually going to, so in order to run this, I'm actually just going to copy these into the public folder of our module five. I'm gonna really quickly make sure and check that I'm in the directory that I want to be in. Yep, desktop, start. And I'm going to just paste all the, um, all the files that we created before in module two into the public folder for now. And this is also how we're going to start you know, actually hosting our application. So once we have all these, uh, these files, let's go through and actually edit each one. In start, in public, you'll see we have these three files here. And uh, what we're going to do is we should just start stripping this stuff away. We're going to strip away the basically everything that's up here and everything that's down here until we're left only with the form. And you might have noticed that we're actually also even taking away that controller part. Yeah. We'll get to that in a little bit. We're going to do the same for our main. We're going to strip away everything here, here, and I know I'm going to miss one div here or there. Uh, you can check, some line will match them for you if you just look at yeah. if you're missing one there. And two, yeah. One more. Actually, you know what? I don't even think I need this. I think I just need the clear fix. You're the boss. I mean, the, if the idea is to make our partials as small as they need to be, then smaller is better, I think. Ah, OK. Makes sense. Yeah, and I'm going to also strip away this for the uh, register page. Now, before I just go ahead and delete all these, I'm actually going to go and create basically um, a base template page. And in this base template page, I'm going to need to require all the strips scripts again. So instead of deleting them as a whole, I'm actually going to just copy them in here. Actually, I'm going to copy this entire thing. I'm going to paste it in here for now. And I'm just going to delete the form part of it, or this entire middle div. And in login, or and then in register, I am going to strip away everything except for the form. So I know that was a little bit of a hectic process, but I hope you understand what I mean. Uh, we're basically transforming our like previously pretty large HTML files into just these simple partials that only contain the exact parts that we need. So instead of repeating the poll for like pulling in AngularJS and repeating pulling in the CSS, you're just going to do it once and well, I guess pull a Houdini and you know switch the pages without switching the pages? What are you doing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I'm going to do. <laughs> so this is basically, this is going to be um, our, our base that everything else is going to sit in. And in here, we're going to call an ng view or div ng view. And in a little bit, we're basically going to say, hey, um, you know all that other stuff? As we need it, we're going to insert that stuff into basically this ng view div. So I'm going to save this as index.html here. OK, so now that we have that, oh, no, I'm still in my demo. Just wanted to make sure I didn't have more slides I wanted to show you guys. <laughs> so, so now that we have this ng view here, well, we'll also need to kind of start adding that, that routing in our controller. So in order to add routing to controller, let's go in and look at our. Are these the same kind of routes in Express? 
Yeah, so, I mean, the routing actually works pretty similarly as the way that it, it does in Express, except we're kind of faking things here. So um, we're going to, in a moment, I'm going to show you how I'm going to do the routing. But basically, the routing here, it doesn't actually go to these different endpoints. It'll it'll detect what URL you're at, and it'll automatically show you that page in the view, but it's not going to go to a different link. So um, to the... I mean, I think as a user, you'll see this routing work, and you'll basic, it'll basically seem kind of like what it's doing in Express. So, OK. So let's start by doing our routing. The first thing we're going to need is we're actually going to need um, one dependency. We're going to need ng route. And I think I need to put these in braces. Uh, so ng route isn't something that's actually included in with uh, the typical Angular package. So we actually need to pull this down from our CDN and into our index here as another script. Now, I've added this somewhere here, and I'm just going to copy and paste this in. Is that because there could be more than one router for Angular? Or? Yeah, so Angular actually has a couple of different routers. The ng route is one that is you know, standard with Angular. But there are also, there's also another quite popular one called UI route, and it has a couple more features. But I just want to stick, you know, stick with the basics for today. Whatever Angular says is there, that's what we're going to use, and not get too fancy. So I'm just going to paste that in under here before chirp apps, of course. Wait, I don't want to. I'm sorry. I don't want to purchase that license right now. Apologies, everyone. Um, <laughs> And I'm actually going to go back and, yeah. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to create routing similar to this. So I'm going to paste this in, and then I'll just describe this, because I think it's so much clearer once you actually see this in action. So what we're doing now is we're actually going to use route provider, which is how Angular actually decides which um, or what happens when a user goes to a URL and, you know, what we should display on the page. So for instance, when we just go to the root, uh, we want the template that we're going to use to be the main HTML. And we want our controller to be our main controllers. So in that way, that's why we don't need to define the controller explicitly in our uh, main HTML again. That's why we could strip that out. Because it's already going to know when it's using the main HTML template that, hey, we're going to need that main controller. And we're going to use that scope. And in a similar way, we're going to do that for login and also for registration. So when we hit the, the register or the login um, URL, it's going to automatically bring up either the login view or the register view as appropriate. And you'll see that we basically specify the same controller for each of those because they can share that one controller. So I'm going to save this. And I will try to run it. Now, before, um, in, the, in the module two slides, we talked about having to use a sort of lightweight HTTP server to, to use this, and we weren't going to give much explanation. It's kind of fortunate that we're, we're now doing this in module five, because we do have a server. We have our Mongo, uh, sorry, our node server <laughs> to actually serve out all this data statically, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do so because we'd run into cross-origin request errors. Yeah, that just makes it simpler. I guess, um, but in production, though, um, if you're actually doing this at full scale, um, another option is you can serve out your Angular app on CDN, the whole app, and then um, just set your server to, in, to implement um, cross-origin re resource sharing. And afterwards, you can use the same server, but share out, um, spread out the um, application on the CDN itself to kind of reduce the workload on the server. Yeah, absolutely. So now we can actually, so I've just ran the server with npm start. We've put everything in the public. And actually, I'm going to show you where this happens in app.js. In app.js, what we're basically looking for is we're saying, uh, yeah. So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, anything in the pub that's in the public folder, just you know, serve that as static. And that's why uh, all of our partials here can be viewed. That's that middleware magic. Yep. So now when we run localhost, this bodes not well for us. That's it. Uh, you can try hitting the up button on, I hit the issue, I think it's the same issue I hit before. If you go to your Mongo, not your Mongo, your um, your, your other window, the node one, hit up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the same issue we had last time too. I'm not exactly sure why the PowerShell is doing that to us. Yeah. 
Um, but hey, I'm glad we can fix it now. Okay, you'll see that this is really wide, and that's because I actually took off some of the styling. So I'm actually going to add that back into the index. Um, luckily, I have our original styling that I know we want to use. And what we're basically missing is we were missing the column in the middle because that's what determined that form's size. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to use it in our index. And I'm just going to say, hey, make all of our content. So everything, uh, NGV will be all the subviews that we have, and they'll all be aligned by this. They'll all have the CSS applied to it. So every view will have the CSS applied to it. Yeah, exactly. Because NGV is only going to be in here. So um, this, for those of you who aren't familiar with Bootstrap, this is basically just going to, you know, uh, make our or make the content of our page be in the middle of the page and with some slight border on each side. So I'm going to run this again, and you, you can see this you know, works pretty much like before. We can type in something here, say hello, chirp, and that posts. Say hello again. Wait, no, that, that would mean my name is hello. <laughs> chirp, and it works just as before, except now you can see we're actually serving this on localhost. Um, we still don't have a way, though, to actually get to our login and register views. So let's take a moment and actually build that out real quick. I believe I have added the navigation just as a nice little component here. I'm going to drag this in because this is just a lot of styling to have to type in. And I trust that you guys know front-end styling quite well. So I'm going to actually just you know, use a nav element from Bootstrap. And it's going to just make the nav bar be on the top of the page like you've seen before. Uh, you can see here I've made one link, um, which is also our sort of brand image. It just says chirp. That'll lead us to the, uh, the root of the site. And then we'll also have a login page. Uh, we'll also have a login and register link. So everything on index.html is what appears on every page. Yeah, exactly. So index.html is going to be the root page that we access here. And I think it makes more sense once you actually see it in action like this. Um, because you know, no matter where we go now from here, that index.html is always going to be there. And we're always at index.html. And even when we navigate to these different links, you can see that our URL is changing. But if you actually look at the requests that we're making to the server, we're only basically getting um, these partial views and rendering them where we set ng view. So now that we have that done and we actually see the files, we should probably make calls for API. Because even though this is technically on the server, we're still getting just basically that array of data. And every time you refresh the page, it goes away. So um, let's actually start calling the APIs that Steven has so graciously made for us. Oh, I toiled over them. You really did. That was two modules <laughs> worth of API creation. I mean, <laughs> I would be angry if I were you if I didn't use these. So OK. Uh, we'll exit out of these for now because, again, we've pretty much made the boilerplate uh, placeholder functions for everything. So uh, let's start, hmm, what should we start with? Let's start with actually getting authentication. Yeah, because we, we need to auth before we can do anything. Yeah, so we'll need some authentication to actually start getting, uh, getting the APIs. And for that, I have some slides. Uh, so let's talk about actually implementing and displaying that authentication on the page. So what we're going to use is we're going to use this HTTP core service from Angular. That's, something, that's one thing that's already bundled with Angular. And what it's going to do is it's going to um, return a promise with, a success, with success and error callbacks whenever you're uh, making an HTTP uh, or AJAX request. And you make it in you know, this format. It's pretty straightforward. You say, hey, HTTP, get uh, some endpoint for me and do you know, whatever's in the success callback if that call is successful. And we can do get, um, you set the header, you post, put, and delete. Um, yeah, head, I'm pretty sure head's some type of method. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it, I mean, it sets the header. Yeah. So we'll also need to set, save our authentication status. Now, I touched on root scope before, but root scope basically is 
um, a scope that's available to the entire module. And it's not great to use globals, but we're just going to use that for now to basically save um, our authentication. And once a user is logged in, you know, we have access to their username and we can display that. We show that anywhere and we can save their authentication status for the duration of the time that they're, um, you know, in that. So it's app. very convenient because it's useful anywhere. So we don't necessarily, any view that we have, we can see that we have authenticated information, right? Yeah. And we're also going to start logging out our users as well as we're going to start showing and hiding elements based on authentication. So so for example, we can make it so that only authenticated users can post, or authenticated users can see the, you know, the login, the sorry, the log out button, but unauthenticated users will be able to see the register and login button. That way, you know, we're actually showing the elements as they're needed for the user. Nice. And finally, we're going to redirect the user. So we're going to check the authentication status uh, as we're making that request. And we're going to use yet another Angular service uh, location to change the URL that the user is on and redirect the user to another page as it's needed. So for example, uh, once someone has logged in, you know, we can redirect them to the main view and have them see the feed and potentially post something and same for register. So with that, let's actually go through and implement our authentication. We're going to go in here in this authentication thing here, and we're actually going to start by putting in the dependencies that we're going to need. So as we, I said before, we're going to need root scope, and we're also going to need location. And now I'm going to go up and actually create that root scope. So I believe what I do is I do run. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know what? I don't want to do this wrong. Let me make sure. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> uh, authentication. And that is going to be in module, module five. five. Yeah, so we're continuing now. We're actually on the readme. It's the module five section. Yeah. yeah. OK, so I was close. Uh, yeah, that actually, yeah, I was doing it right. right. You do run, and then you run a function, and then you say, uh, and you say root scope here, because we're going to actually need to declare the root scope here, so we'd start. Um, making changes to it, and we're going to do, 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 do. So great, and this is where we're going to put in our changes to the root scope. So much as we did for uh, our for declaring the scope variables here, we're going to do the same thing and basically declare some uh, root scope variables. So we're going to say root scope, and the first thing that we want to do is we want to set an authenticated boolean to basically say, hey, is, uh, is the user on the site right now authenticated? We're going to default that to false, of course. Change this to root scope. And we're also going to save that authenticated user's username. And we're going to call that current, current user and leave that blank for now. And so now, uh, once when we're actually logging in, we can uh, we can set those root scope variables. Uh, I forgot one more thing. We have a lot of dependencies here. We're actually going to use HTTP as well because we're going to be calling those you HTTP key authentication yeah. endpoints. I'm going to clear this placeholder data for now and say when we're logging in, we want to make a post and we want to make that to auth login and we're going to actually post our um, what is it called our, our user that's from the login page so the user model here that we've created and is accessible here we're actually going to just pass that root scope user um, to the login function And we're just going to only worry about the success callback for now. What can go wrong? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is a carefully choreographed demo, right? So it's probably not too much. OK, so, so now that we've passed the scope user to the auth slash login endpoint, uh, we're in the success handler. So this is what would, so this is what will go into if that authentication is actually successful. And so if the authentication is successful, like I said, we want to do a couple of things. First of all, we want to set our root scope dot current user or the authenticated to true because we just authenticated a user we also want to set our root scope 
current user to be the current user's username. I'm just having a lot of trouble typing, but Starbucks. these are all correct things. So, uh, so you'll see that we got the date, um, data back from this in this callback. So I'm just going to access the user variable. And so this the is the user same user name. object that's sitting in the MongoDB database, right? Yeah, and that's what that's what Stephen's passing back to me uh, in that API, and that's what I'm getting here in basically the response. So I'm getting the data, that user, that username, and I'm also going to set the location. So redirecting the user basically to our root uh, when or if this is correct. So we can do that by using location path. So and this is this will just change the path in the URL and therefore of course also change our view. So I think this is right for login, and we're going to do the same for register. At the end of the day, these are pretty similar commands, except that one is actually registering a user, and one is, and one is logging one in. So we can do essentially the same thing. Um, because after a user is successfully registered, they're automatically going to be authenticated, and they're going to be logged in. So I'm going to save this, and I'm going to run it here. I'm going to just register a new account for myself. Hopefully this works. No errors. Um, try it. Is it? OK. Nope, 404. Not, oh, not. It, you know what? I don't think the path is register. I think it's sign up. No, it's not up. register. It's sign up. Yeah, you're right. I didn't, I didn't even catch up. So let's try again with the right path. OK, awesome. And now I'm signed in. Um, however, this is not really what we want. So now that we actually have users you know, being able to sign in, we should actually display that sign in somewhere. So let's actually display a sign in user up here and start hiding these login and register links. We'll also probably want to make a logout function. OK, so if I'm signed in, I shouldn't, like it's depending on whether I'm signed in or not, it'll show me. Yeah, exactly. And so first, actually, let me go make that logout function. Because if you can log in, you should be able to log out. Yep. So similar to the way that the logout function was in that request, um, or is stored in the request, we're going to actually store our logout function in the root scope so that it can also be accessed from anywhere. So we're actually going to create a root scope function here. We're going to call this log out. I always have a lot of anxiety over whether I should call things log out or sign out, which I understand is not a real problem. It's just one that I'm always it's grappling with. Super tough problem, Holland. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, all we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, um, or we're going to deauthenticate the user from Angular, we, but we also need to call that actual so, yeah, the bottom HTTP two endpoint. Are, are locally un signing you out, but not yeah. actually. Yeah, exactly. And before I forget, we'll actually also need the HTTP dependency here since we're using it. So we're going to use HTTP, and I believe it is a post? It's a post. No, it's a get. Sorry. It is a get. You said that, but I started typing in get. I feel like. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a get. Okay. I'll double check for you. I'm pretty sure. Auth and it's yep. auth.logout? Uh, sign out. Sign out. Mm -hmm. See, these things are difficult. We need to just ban one of those terms those from the world, and then <laughs> no one will get confused anymore. Um, so I'm not going to actually use a callback for that, because I'm just going to assume that works. It is a lazy what way to do it. And I'm sorry, but <laughs> let's just leave that for now and start running that. Oh, we don't actually have a way to call this logout function. We should call these logout login um, functions from actually our navigation, right? Because we want to be able to do those actions from anywhere. And so for that, we're actually going to edit them in index. So first of all, let us, I am going to do what I always do when it's the HTML part. I am going to copy it in. Yeah, nobody wants to type that. Plus, getting HTML perfect and beautiful is just, yeah. it's, I mean, I wouldn't call it not fun, because I, I love front end stuff, but it's well, not. You usually write in Jade, don't you, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, Jade is the other templating engine that you can use with Express. We use EJS today just because it's really, I mean, we haven't, you haven't really seen it in action yet, but EJS is really, really great for. It's like embedded JavaScript, yeah. embedded C Sharp, embedded Ruby. It's the same idea. Um, it's just 
JavaScript that's in, embedded into HTML, which is kind of silly to think about because on the front end you do have that too. Yeah. But um, it's just a Jade is a nicer way to write HTML. Yeah. But the syntax is significantly different enough that we didn't want to throw another new thing at you when we're already doing th four technologies. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually going to save this. Um, what I did here is I have some. Well, I have some that one thing here, which is the ng click element, and um, and it'll sh it shows log out. So ng click is basically whenever you click this element, you're going to run this Angular function, and we're going and we're also using um, basically the current user here, and we're just displaying the current user in the sign in if if one exists. So one other thing that I wanted to show is actually these ng show directives that we're using. So this ng show directive basically says, hey, if the user is authenticated, um, so if authenticator is true, then show this element. If it's false, then don't show this element. So ng show takes a true or false. Yeah, it takes a true or false. And, we can, and there's actually another nifty sibling of it, I guess you would say, which is ng hide. And we can use that ng hide on our login and register links. So ng hide will basically hide the element if, um, the, if the Boolean that's passed to it What's is the inverse, true. inverse, really. Yeah, exactly. So with this, when we log in, Hmm. It's not showing up. Did I save? First of all, did I save this? This is the right file. Oh, uh, you know what I didn't do? This isn't the completed. This is in the completed. I'm going to paste, copy. <laughs> I, I keep putting things in the wrong in folder, the wrong and yeah. I'm really, really sorry. So usually when I do it, I open up the particular directory in Sublime so I don't confuse yeah. it like that. Uh, because you opened up the whole repository. That's probably why. I did open up the whole repository. But oh, right. you saw what I did. Yeah, yeah, we all saw it. And we believe let's it. actually. All right, there we go. And log in. Right, and now oh. you'll see up here, we, said, we say signed in as Helen1. That's the username that you all just saw me use. And it shows the logout as well, because these show if the user is authenticated. OK, awesome. Um, one piece you'll see that we're still missing, though, is the actual feed that we want to show. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the piece that we'll do next. So the database is empty right now anyway, so it should be empty. I actually populated some items in the database, because uh, I'm sneaky, beforehand, so that, when, so that when our get request is made, we'll actually start seeing things um, populate on that page. Okay, so cool. I, ju I just had a couple of items in so there. You so socialize you socialized know with yourself working. a bit on, on Trump. I did, actually. <laughs> you just see me say hi to myself like, a couple of times. I mean, I thought about faking your name in there, but like, I don't know if you'd appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I don't know. I might have. It's not creepy if you just do like, "Hi, Steven," and then yeah, if you do oh, hey. on my back. <laughs> Great demo, Helen. Oh, thanks. Like, I don't know. I, I seriously, that might have been my sample data. I'm really sorry. <laughs> so the next thing we're actually going to talk about is we're going to talk about services. So services uh, in. Angular are basically, you know, uh, helper functions for controllers. Because what we talked about before is controllers are, you know, what is basically massaging and bringing that data and putting it in the scope for the view to look at. But if you want to, you know, do a lot of heavyweight requests and stuff, like even to uh, what we just did with the authentication controller and making those requests, we typically want to put those in a service. So there are, so services organize the logic basically of your code instead of just um, logic of the, your code outside of just basically manipulating your models. It'll actually persist data outside of controllers if that's something that you need. So, you know, being able to use this instead of root scope is definitely much better practice. It'll share data between your controllers and it'll also, um, and you'll also just inject them into your controllers as you need them. So, for instance, if you had an authentication service, we'd only put that in the authentication controller because that's the only one that needs it. So there are a couple of different kinds of services within Angular. Um, there's a factory service, which is something that we're going to use. And that basically, um, and you know, these are a bit complicated as concepts because they're all fairly, fairly similar. But basically, you can think of these as being the differences between the services in Angular. A factory will basically, um, will 
return a value to you, and you're going to receive that, the value that is returned. For service, you'll use that if you want to receive basically a new instance of a created object, so an object that's already created. And a provider is versatile because that's sort of the, the grandfather object that all these other services are based off of. Um, and that's most useful if you have an API that needs to be configured sort of before your app starts running. And if this is all too complicated for you, don't worry. We're just going to start using um, a factory and not worry about the rest for today. So if they want to, if you want to get more detailed information, probably look yeah. at the yeah, look at the Angular uh, JS docs because they go into this much, much deeper. But basically, a factory is great for reusing logic, and a service is great for sharing data. A provider is great if you need um, a lot more functionality or you really want to customize something. I think that's I think that's maybe more succinct way of describing like there are different use cases. Okay. Um, Another thing I want to discuss is actually a resource. So Stephen alluded this uh, a couple of times when he was creating that fully RESTful API that we're actually now going to access for our posts. But a resource is basically a really wonderful, very high level Angular um, module, actually. Or no, Angular service. Angular module. Service? Angular. Angular module, it's a module. Angular module um, that allows you to not have to manually manipulate like HTTP requests like we just did. Instead, it basically, if you give it a fully RESTful endpoint, it'll say, OK, I got this. Like, Give me that endpoint, and I'm just going to uh, run whatever methods you need me to when you need me to do them, instead of you having to specify specifically, OK, on get request for this year, I'll do this on success callback, whatever else. It'll just take care of that for you. And we're actually going to see this in practice in a little bit. So first, uh, let's start off with creating a factory to get all of our requests, or no, to get all our posts. So I'm going to put that here, and I'm just going to say app.factory, and I'm going to call this post service. You could also call it post factory, but I like that, you know, post service, postal service. Anyways, <laughs> don't let me distract you guys with my dorky <laughs> things. And we're going to pass it that HTTP um, service because we'll need that to, of course, make our HTTP requests. And in here, we're going to say, we're going to create a variable called factory. And we're going to make it empty for now. And then we're going to create one function here called get all. That's basically actually going to make those HTTP calls. Uh, um, and I also want, to, yeah. So we're going to make the HTTP call within this function. So we're going to pass this post service basically to our main controller to get stuff, or to get the posts. But we're going to define all its functions in here. So in here, we're just going to then make our HTTP call, say HTTP get, and then the endpoint is API slash posts, right? And I think that's it. So we're just going to pass it basically the the post um, here. Yeah, it should just be a get as long yeah. as you're authenticated, it'll work. And I and then in here because we're going to use this post service, we're actually going to add the post service as a dependency. So we're going to leave this as being set to blank for now because we want this to actually run independently of that and. We're going to set this to, uh, we're going to, first of all, make a call to that post service. So we'll do post, uh, to the post service get all. So we'll do post service get all. And then because, oh, and I need to return the factory here. So in here, we're basically going, uh, once we make this call, we're going to get a success, um, we're going to want to wait for its success callback. How long is the post service factory? Um, is that accessible from any controller? It's accessible from any controller as long as you include it as a dependency. Okay. So that's the so that's the beauty of the um, of the, these services, right? Is that you can use them in whatever controller that you need. Okay. So I'm go actually going to do get all success data. And 
So basically, if this call that we're making is correct, we're going to um, set our scope.post to the data that it returned back. So if this seems a little bit more convoluted to you, I understand. And I want to explain that a little bit. We're basically doing this so that all of this is abstracted away. So if we needed posts, for instance, on another page um, or something, we can, we can reuse that code quite easily. And also, you know, if we wanted to, for instance, change the API endpoint, we don't have to go around changing that everywhere in our app. So we'll save this and see if it works. It does not. That's the bugger. <laughs> yep. Cannot read property success of undefined. I'm probably mm. calling that wrong. Or if it's undefined, that means get all is returning undefined. Get all is returning undefined. Your post service get all success function. Get all success mm. function data. The post. Um. Yeah, because this is the same. Um, as that and yeah, include a post service base URL factory that get all return. Oh, oh that's not what I did. I did not actually return this, so I'm just giving, oh, I'm okay. just passing yeah. it like You're a blank thing. Yeah, yeah. Whew, okay, now this should work. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so because we already had some data um, saved in our <laughs> MongoDB, yeah, <laughs> see. Uh, uh, now it's actually it's actually making that call to our server and is returning back the posts that we have, so that's awesome. We can see the posts that we have, um, but our posts mechanism still. I mean, I keep doing that. I keep typing my last name as the message that I want to send. It'll add it in here as you can see, but when we refresh the page, um, it actually you know doesn't show up. And that's because we're still saving that. We're adding that to the posts that we have here, but we're not sending that out anywhere. Oh, uh, I actually want to make one last change here. Instead of you having you type in your name here, uh, let's already actually logged in. Yeah. yeah. Since you're already logged in, let's actually go ahead and um, show you know your Absolutely. screen name. So because that's in our main partial, we're actually going to change that here. And instead of having you type in your name, I'm just going to do. A tiny heading. It'll be the current user. It's going to say, oh, current user says. Says? Says, yeah, thank you. Grammar. Not my strong suit. <laughs> um, and now we actually want to manipulate our posts here. So before we do that, um, I want to go back and talk about you know, the ng resource that we briefly touched on. So instead of actually having to go through and implement all of these for every single fact, for, or implement another function in our factory for every single request that we're going to make, why don't we just use that ng resource? And we can actually do that really easily. Um, it's only one line, but we need to first import that ng resource module in, uh, similar to the way that we did that for ng route, because that's also not something that comes standard packaged with Angular. So I have the link in here somewhere, and we're going to just add that into our index.html. Save that and also add that into our um, Angular module as a dependency for the entire app. This should be a comma. OK. And now, instead of having this you know, quite complicated factory here, we are going to just be able be able to delete all of that. Good exercise, though, so you guys know how it works, even though I basically typed it in and deleted it right after. And we're going to use one really simple line that I always happen to get wrong. And right, really actually simple line. It's surprising I get that wrong so often. And we're basically going to return it a resource that's generated by the, um, by the resource module. And what it's going to do is it's going to take that entire endpoint um, that we have complete with the ID, and it's going 
and it's going to create all these helper functions um, that you'll be able to use in, in, your other, in whatever controller that you include it in. So now, first of all, um, instead of using the get all request that we just made, since we deleted that, um, we don't even need a success function, actually. All we need to do is say, hey, uh, make sc scope.posts into the post serve and set that equal to the post service dot query. Or, sorry, set that to what the return is from post service dot query. And what query will basically, you know, just send a get request to the API slash posts and get all of our, our cheaps. Cheaps, right? Yeah, because it knows it's a, it's a resource that could just say, hey, it's doing the get all. With yeah, us. exactly. So now let's refresh the page and see if that works. It does not. What is wrong? Resource is not defined. Ah, that's because I defined HTTP up here, but I really just need. You just need a resource, right? Resource. Yeah. And so right now, we actually need to probably hide this if the user is not authenticated. I'm going to do that next. Yeah, you probably want to do that. Um, but you can see that the ng resource is, is working. By just using that tiny query line, we've managed to be able to get all our entire feed. So let's, let's go and hide this forum. We'll again use ng hide. No, ng show. We'll only show the posting form if, some, if the user is authenticated. But we'll, of course, leave the post stream so that anyone can access that. Awesome. And now, actually, let's log in and make sure that works. Yep, it does. And so now when you're logged in, this it should be zero. Yeah, it's it showing up. That would be nice, too. Um, so it's true. Yeah, yeah. OK, so, so now let's actually go and work on our last little bit. Uh, work on being able to post to our cheap stream, trip stream, cheap, cheap stream. Cheap, <laughs> cheap, cheap, cheap stream. Yeah, cheap, cheap stream. Cheap like stream. Yeah. yeah, tweet, cheap. Yeah. Yeah, if, yeah. If, I mean, if we're going for a one to one map, I mean, that works. I figure, I, yeah, I figure everybody's already <laughs> caught on to that, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's actually go and change our post. So, if you recall in our main, uh, when this when the post form is submitted, it's actually still going to call that post. Yeah, it's still going to call that post function, and we'll leave that post function to um, to itself right here. And it's, but the only difference is that we'll actually use resource to go ahead and add something to it. So all we're going to do is we're going to say post service, and we're going to use the save function to be able to um, to save that new post in. So, so it'll it'll secretly like under the covers call the API that we need to yeah because we did a restful implementation right yeah exactly on the back end so since we have mm, how do I say this okay since we are using our current user instead of actually having someone type in their name why don't we set the created by to actually the current user so let's do that first before we call anything we're gonna call scope we're gonna say scope dot new post dot created by we're going to set that to the root scope dot current user. We want to make sure to actually add the root scope in here as a dependency. And next, we want to set that created created at created at. There's that tense there. Again. <laughs> yeah, uh, we want to set the created at to the current time. So we're going to set created at to date. Now. Okay, and so now that we've set up new posts, we can actually go in and save it. We're going to save scope that new post, and we're going to give this a success function as well. I spelled success wrong. And so what we want to do here, we basically want to say, well, after we, we've done this, uh, first of all, we want to make sure that we clear new post again so that it's ready for another cheap. So we want to do that. And we also, of course, want to actually refresh the, uh, the entire cheap stream. Um, so we'll just go ahead and call that query again. And because of that two-way data binding, you know, it's just going to refresh. Uh, it's just going to augment the view as we need it. Okay. So I'll save this, and um, I'll run this again. 
you might have noticed that when we refresh the page, we actually log ourselves out. And that's because we haven't implemented sessions on the client side. But once we log in, OK, so I'll say something here. Is it because I already said hi? No, I don't think I don't so. Think so. Uh, inspect element. Undefined is not a function. Scope dot post. Scope dot post, yeah. So scope is undefined. Uh, oh, so where did I? Post service scope dot post. Am I creating this wrong? Good question, Helen. What was the right way for me to do it? I ask my former self. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I see what I did. So you want to actually pass that call back in instead of doing what I did, which is calling a success. I can't find where I put uh, in the code. Scope, okay. Uh, success right there. Yeah. yeah. And so I want to make sure that I have my indentation correct. Okay, awesome. I'll save this, and I will. It's probably refresh, right? Yeah. I was kind of hoping that I didn't have to, you know? Yeah, I think it loads up all those views already, so. OK. Say something. I'll say something else. OK, awesome. So now that actually worked. Uh, I said one more time, and it chirped successfully, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's displaying in our chirp feed once again. So now that you know we're done with this, we've pretty much implemented all of, I think, our necessary parts. Uh, we've managed to interact with that REST API that's, um, that we created in past modules to be able to authenticate our users, register new users, sign out our users. And we're also able to both get um, or we're able to get all of our cheeps through that, through that get request on posts, and we're also able to write posts to it. Now, you can extend this a lot more because, again, that endpoint um, will allow you to access um, individual cheeps. It'll allow you to do, um, you know, update them and delete them if necessary. But I think we're just going to leave this for now. Awesome. So we've already created, we've created all the basics that we need for the whole application. We've actually got it running locally. So in the next module, what we'll have, uh, I will go ahead and figure out how to take this thing, deploy it to the cloud, so that everybody in the world can cheap and cheap together. Yeah. That'll be fun. All right, cool. So we'll be back in about 10 minutes, and we'll show you how to get this deployment working and um, talk about a couple other mean stack tools, and, and then we'll wrap this MVA up. See you soon. Right, and welcome back. Uh, this is module six of Do You Know What I Mean? Uh, the Mean Stack Jumpstart. This is our last and final module. Very sad. It is. Um, so throughout today, we created, we started with uh, explanation what the Mean Stack was. We created a basic HTML front end um, using Angular, but not integrating it yet. Then we built out the back end using MongoDB and Express with Node.js. And then we had all APIs. The last module, Helen had the pleasure of taking us through how to integrate those APIs with our, what? <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. I'm sorry. Hold it together, right? OK, so now, um, and she created, uh, she created the integration between the Angular front end and our application back end. And um, so now everything works locally. We have everything running. And all we need to do now is share it with the world and get it going. So this, uh, this module is all about how do we deploy our um, main application. So the first thing we want to do, uh, so I guess this module will go through. The first thing we'll do is we'll set up MongoDB in the cloud. We'll configure and deploy an express application. And then we'll talk about just some other tools. Um, just have a quick conversation about a few of those things that you can use past this, uh, this tutorial. And um, we'll let you go after that. OK, so setting up MongoDB in the cloud, um, what we'll do is we'll stand up a MongoDB server. So the options that you have in the cloud are stand up your MongoDB server via VMs. Uh, 
There's other like technologies such as Docker and things like that you can um, research. That works on any cloud provider. Um, Azure also has a fully managed uh, option, a fully managed database option, which is Mongo Lab, and it provides uh, MongoDB database as a service, PaaS or DBAAS database database as a service. So um, to do that, we're gonna go ahead. And we're gonna go with the last uh, setting up Mongo Lab because the easiest way for us to do it and the fastest way. It'll probably take us about five minutes to get that set up. So uh, what it does, it allows us for a fully managed database. You don't have to worry about patching or update the MongoDB server, as well as you don't have to really um, worry about scaling that server as well. It'll just scale automatically. Um, you just pay the monthly fee. And for a sandbox instance, it won't cost us anything. And we can mess around with as much as we want and um, get our application working live. All right, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to jump over to the Azure portal. So we're going to jump over to manage.windowsazure.com. Take a few seconds for the, the portal to load up. And let me make sure, OK, I'm on my, looks like my internal one. That's fine. So we'll add a new service. Oh, I can't do that with my internal one. OK, I have to use my external one. Open up incognito window. I'm only doing that because I need to separate my account since I'm a Microsoft employee. Uh, let's just see. There we go. Let's go ahead and sign in here. And it'll take a few seconds, but we should, in just a few moments, we should be able to switch over to our subscription and activate a Mongo Lab account and just get the ball rolling on integrating our app. So I'm going to switch over to my uh, subscription I want to spin the app, the MongoDB service on. And of course, we have to reload the entire portal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. And so we go to the add-on section here, which is, uh, ooh, I got Zoom it on here too. Take this little add thing here. And it's actually a marketplace. I'll do it one more time for you guys. So it's on bottom left. So if you're new to Azure, that's what you're going to do. All we'll do is we'll say, uh, Add new, and we'll click on Marketplace. And under all these services, under here you'll see Mongo Lab. There's also MongoDB. So Mongo Lab and MongoDB are two companies that offer MongoDB as a fully managed service. Um, one is by actual Mong the MongoDB company, MongoDB Inc. And they they are the maintainers of it. And then you also have Mongo Lab, which is the second option. The reason why I'm using Mongo Lab today and not MongoDB is because the minimum cost for the MongoDB fully managed is like $400 a month. And Mongo Lab has a free sandbox instance that we could use. So I'm feeling cheap today. So we'll do that. All right, cool. So uh, we'll do Mongo Lab. Sandbox again, remember, it's uh, $0 a month. Uh, it doesn't really cost us a thing. And um, oh, it escaped too many times. Jump right back in there really quick. There we go. Let's go back down. OK. And um, we'll just go ahead and click Next. Oh, we got to pick a name. We'll call this Chirp App. Next. And so you'll see this like review purchase and legal terms. And by clicking purchase, you know, all the legal um, jargon there. Um, but although you're clicking purchase and all that, you're, you're going to see that it is a sandbox plan and it costs nothing. So, which is quite nice. OK. Um, and we'll go ahead and click purchase. And what we'll see is it's, hey, it's purchasing, and it's going to start provisioning that for us. It's going to go off to Mongo Lab, which will handle standing up that database server for us so that we can go ahead and connect and create a new, um, a new uh, connect our application to it. So while that's happening, we're going to create a new Azure website. Go to Plus. And um, so this will be the URL that you guys can chirp to and do all the crazy stuff. So we'll do chirp azure.azure. Oh, we don't have to do that. Let's do chirp-azure. And that URL is free. And it'll be chirp-azure.azurewebsites.net. And this is where we can start cheaping to. And so now our application, our chirp app application, uh, our chirp app um, database is up. So all we have to do really is just click on this guy and click the connection information and copy our connection URL. 
Now, if we go back and open up the Chirp application, uh, so if you go into GitHub repository and Chirp under the Chirp folder, that's our final um, implementation of the application. So uh, I can just go ahead and copy this and open up in Sublime. I think this is it, but let me double check. Okay. So one thing that we do need to change, uh, so this is the part called I guess, um, so we've already created the, um, set, we set up the MongoDB database, we're good there, we don't have to worry about updating or patching stuff, scaling database, all that good stuff. So now we're on configuring the data, the, the, blah, blah, blah. Configuring and deploying our main application. So uh, before we can actually deploy the application, there are some things that are very specific to uh, your application, that, um, to the, the environment of the application where environment variables become quite handy. So what we can do first is we'll go ahead and change the, um, the app.js. Instead of being hard-coded to connect to the local database for, um, for MongoDB, we'll assume that uh, unless, so Node.js, uh, to actually pull in environment variables in Node.js, you just grab the global process object environment and the name environment variable we're looking for, so ours is dev env. And this is handy because now we can say that if we want to run the app locally, all we have to do is just set environment variable um, before we run node to uh, set dev env to true. And then that'll uh, connect to local database and the application run in a dev, in a kind of a dev mode. Um, otherwise, we can connect to um, the special Mongo lab connection string, and we'll grab this. And what we can do is we can, uh, so we see we have a uh, chirp app here, and that should just create the chirp app. I'm actually forgot if this is a database name or if that's, I think that's, uh, that's the collection name. We'll see, we'll try that. I thought before I added something else here, but that's all right. Okay, so that'll connect us to the MongoDB database on, uh, on the server and, and the cloud if you will. And now when we launch Azure websites, dev end will not be um, declared and will automatically uh, default to the cloud version because on the Azure website there will be no MongoDB database. Um, now in Azure websites we can also set uh, parameters for our environment variables. Um, one good practice is uh, don't put the connection string for your MongoDB database in source control. Because if you ever want to open source your thing, uh, you'll have your credentials right in the application. Um, for the sake of brevity, we're going to just go ahead and throw it in there. But uh, what you really should do is just do an environment variable, um, set that up, and put the environment variable in your Azure website and put it on your local. But just keep it out of the source so that when you do a push and you share the code around, you don't have those keys just floating around in there. Okay. So I set up the, the environment variable. And now what I need to do is create an Azure website. Um, and I did do that, but we do need to configure it for deploying our apps. So we'll call this Chirp Azure here. If we go in, we'll do a setup deployment from source control right here. And um, it's really easy. So there's a few options you have. You have VS Online, which is uh, Microsoft's own um, ALM, Application Lifecycle Management Tool. You have GitHub, Dropbox, Bitbucket, a few things. Um, we're just going to use a local uh, Git repository, which is just really just a Git server that's set up on our Azure website, and we'll just add it as a remote. So we'll grab our Git URL. We're going to go to, actually, I think I should copy out, um, since we're already in a Git repository. Um, actually, I got this here. I don't really. Oh, yeah, I think I copied this over. Let me see. I want to make sure I'm in the right directory before I... Okay, so this was chirp, chirp, app. Okay, so I got to copy that out. So I'm going to go into GitHub. I'm going to grab this, copy it out. I'm going to put it somewhere else just because we shouldn't really put a Git repository in the Git repository. Um, Inception Git. That's, that's a no-no. Okay, so we'll CD into that. I think I need a Git shell because Git's not... Yeah, it's not on this one. That's fine. So grab a git shell. Oh, no. 
Oh no, is your mouse not working anymore? Oh, there it goes. Okay, I thought it died. I was like, this is great. <laughs> okay, here, uh, we'll cd into that directory, get init, um, and we'll just initialize this as an empty repo. We'll do git add. Um, actually, I'm gonna do a notepad git ignore. So I don't, uh, and if you're not familiar with git, that just means I want you to avoid installing or including anything in node module. Actually, I believe it's node modules. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll do a git add, which adds everything in the current directory. We'll do a git commit, initial commit. So now we've, we've saved it to a local repository and we see that we only added the stuff that's not in the node module folder. And then we'll do a git remote add Azure. Uh, is it git add? Yeah, git remote, add Azure, and then here. Oh. So if we go back to Azure website, it'll give us the git URL link. We gotta copy that. Paste it back in here. Okay, so now we have the remote. And um, so now if I do a git push, Azure master, it'll push the Azure branch, or the master branch of the Azure remote. And what you'll see here is as this starts to go, now you might be asked to set your uh, source control credentials too. I'll go back and show you how to do that if you do this yourself for the first time. Um, it didn't ask because it's not my first time doing it. Um, so kudosync.net is an open source uh, PaaS platform that uh, handles deployments of PHP, Python, and Node.js applications as well as .NET. And, um, it copies all the files over, and then it starts to do the installation. So because it detects it's a Node.js application, it detects that you have um, a package JSON, and it goes in and installs all the stuff um, manually. Um, you might see sometimes that there's a, uh, one of the things that kind of, um, you might hit a hiccup is with any native modules. If you notice that we used a um, bcrypt Node.js because it's a, um, a vanilla JS uh, module but it'll go through here, and a lot of times those, those errors are pretty benign because you'll just fall back to vanilla JavaScript. And um, so now we see it, we've, we've finished successfully and when deployment success was successful. So the output that we saw here is actually gonna match the output, the output that we saw on the command line uh, will be the same output that you see when we run the deployment command. So we can actually see what happened, and we can see how we installed everything, and everything was, you know, everything was good, and you know, we're all great. And now, if nothing went wrong, we should be able to go ahead and launch our, um, our site. And now, if you run into the free mode, you'll see that there's like a small delay in your application uh, because if it's sleeping, uh, or if you haven't touched the application maybe in like 20 minutes or something like that, it'll go to sleep and it'll just be turned off until you touch it again. There's also features like Always On, which always keep your website on, um, but those are standard website features which cost money, but this is free and it's easy to do. And uh, if you want to upgrade, you can just really just go to scale and you could just click, hey, I want to run free, shared, basic, or standard. In my case, I'm running standard, but I really should just be running it free. Um, and then you could actually modify the instance count. So I guess we didn't really talk too much about what Azure Websites is, but it's a um, platform that is kind of an elastic web hosting platform. Uh, it has Heroku style deployments, so the sort of the Git push, and you're able to scale with the power of all the Azure machines all around the world, which is really awesome. And um, as the as your demand gets up, you can actually it'll automatically spin more instances, and as your demand goes down, it'll automatically scale down those instances. You could do things like based on schedule, or you could do things based on um, CPU time, or a few things like that. So it's really really flexible, and um, it's really easy to host a website, which is really awesome. Okay, so now um, if we go back to our app, we'll see that we have our chirp application, our chirp feed, which is completely empty and it's really sad. There's no chirps, so there's nothing in there. I guess you have to go and create some chirps. So we have to go chirp. So let's go and test to see if everything works. We'll go ahead and do a registration. I'll click register. I'll say a set word. I'll put in my password. Great. So now I'm signed in and now I can cheat. You should be able to sign in on this website too and create your own account and see that you can cheat as well. Yeah, um, I just posted something and mm. I can see yours. 
Nice, I'm not alone. But it's funny because I have the, um, we don't have the sessions fully implemented. Yeah. So I can't. Um, if you say something, um, because of the way that we're doing queries, that'll refresh the feed. So I guess if you want to stay logged in, the only way to see new ones is by posting something, uh, which is, you know, maybe unfortunate. But that's cool because it really encourages you to, uh, to, hey, everybody chirp right now. Uh, yeah, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and just go back to Azure websites. If you, if you want to, you know, deploy an if it's your first time deploying on Azure websites, especially through Git, uh, it's great because they'll actually walk you through the steps of you know how to add an Azure remote, how to add credentials, and things like that as you're setting it up. So if you're looking for resources on that, uh, you can actually get that by simply trying it out yourself in Azure websites. Yep. Now, um, what's also cool is that we can go and jump into our Mongo Lab uh, account, and right from the browser, we can actually look at our documents and see all the users that have signed up and all the cheats that are happening right through uh, the back end. So if you just go right into your uh, marketplace, you see uh, Chirp app here, and what we'll do is we'll just click, uh, we don't even need to click on that, we can actually just click this little manage link here, and uh, right down there. And what it'll do, it'll just pop open a new window, and it'll bring us to Mongo Lab dashboard, which is not, in, it's not actually hosted in Azure, it's actually from mongolab.com, um, and it'll actually show us the um, post and the users. So we see that we have three users. Uh, there's three, so someone else signed in too. Let's see. Um, M. Vasquez and a couple other chats. So we have one, two, three, four users. That's cool. So we have people signing in. Remember that we don't hold, we don't store passwords, so we just have hashes, so we have no idea what these passwords are. Um, and that's a really good um, security, um, security practice anyways. And uh, we have our post, and we can look at, we have eight posts here, and we could see, hey, here's a new cheap, um, you know, right now, hey, from El Centro, California, hey, from San Diego, so we got someone on, in California now, we're, we're, we're in San Francisco, so, um, well, not right now, but we're in Seattle now. Oh, we have Mark in Seattle, too, see that? Yeah. So that's pretty cool. So um, everything's kind of flowing right into the database, and everybody's authenticated in, and if we actually uh, cheap something new, we should see more posts coming in. And see, now we have all, all these things, which is really cool. Um, so now we've been able to launch our, our main application to the cloud. It's scalable, because we, all we have to do really is just scale up Azure websites. So if 1,000 people, 100 people, 100,000 people, I don't know how many, high, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how far we can get it, because scalability works, but you also have to develop your application to do that as well. So um, one of the things is like session caches. Um, we're not backplaning servers, so if we have more than one Azure website running, or more, more, more than one instance, um, that session will be local to that server, which it holds that state. So if you're going to do something more advanced, uh, one of the things you could look at is like Redis to connect all those sessions together in one place so that you can scale to how, however many applications, express instances we need, and then you can theoretically handle a very large amount of people um, to the scale of what MongoDB and Redis will give you. Um, but for right now, it's still pretty, uh, it's still pretty beta, but it, it works, and it works pretty well. Um, cool. So we've deployed, we've, cr we've cr created the back end, or we've created, a, we've created the front end. The front end. We've created the back end. Uh, we've tied the two together, and now we've deployed our site. So now it's actually live. So yeah, so now we did a continuous integration. Okay, so now we're good. I'm just looking through my slides again. So now um, the last thing I guess we can just chat about is... What are some other, like, just, I don't know, um, some cool, like, mean tricks we can do to um, make our lives easier? Yeah, so uh, one of the biggest things is, you know, right now or today, we built out this entire mean app from scratch. You know, we actually had to go through and install everything and build the entire app ourselves. But there are actually a lot of pretty great generators that will, you know, scaffold out a really well designed, sort of well architected mean app for you. So uh, there are two that I'd want to talk about in terms of scaffolding tools, and one is uh, mean.io. So as it says, mean.io is a fun and friendly JavaScript. JavaScript full stack for your next web application. And as you can see here, uh, you can actually install mean, uh, or you can install the mean.io scaffolding tool straight from NPM. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, Yeoman, which is a great generator for you know multiple types of apps, not just mean apps. There's a lot. Yeah, there really is a lot. And you can also install Yeoman through NPM. So, NPM is just a really wonderful resource if you're working with Node at all. 
And there are you know, great generators. There's a wide range of mean generators. There's one I like called Angular Full Stack, and I also found one called uh, Generator Dash Mean Stack. Generator Dash Mean Dash Stack. And you can you know, search for a lot of other great generators for you to scaffold out you know, in Angular application. A lot of them will even scaffold out the authentication piece for you, which is, you know, as you saw today, uh, uh, maybe a little bit difficult to manage. Yeah. So it takes care of all those basics, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And um, in addition, you know, NPM, as we talked about before, just has so many different packages uh, that are handy for you to use. We've only used that Passport piece, uh, or we've only used the local authentication piece of Passport. But you know, Passport, that note module that we use to do authentication, also handles uh, you know, pretty much any authentication strategy. Yeah, that's, heard that's of. Facebook on there. Facebook, I think Twitter, yeah. uh, just OpenID. Yeah. A few others. Google, uh, Google GitHub, I think Microsoft account too. Microsoft, yeah. yeah. Pretty much uh, everyone under the sun, you know, they'll help you authenticate against. And they're, I think they're probably the most popular authentication uh, strategy used with the mean stack. Right? Yeah, definitely. Um, there are some some other things that we want to talk about. So, for instance, we use Azure websites to host our to host our mean website. But if you want to, you know. But if there's a bit more that you want to do, if you really want to spin it up using a Linux server, or there's things that you want to customize, there's also, um, there are actually, Bitnami is a great resource for you to get the VMs that are ready, that are ready for you to use in the cloud as, um, as sort of like a mean VM. And once you actually connect this with your Azure account, you can, uh, I'm not connected in right now, but you can actually just go in and it, it'll, you can click a link and I'll just start provisioning out that VM for you. So oh, nice. It's really wonderful. Does it do anything with Docker? Um, I don't think this one in particular does, but Bitnami, in addition to Mean, of course, has just a bunch of really awesome images that you can use for you know whatever your need is. So you could just uh, scaffold out an environment without having to you know, build your own custom VM image. Oh, okay. So that's really cool. And um, one last thing that I wanted us to talk about are the Node.js tools for Visual Studio. So today, Stephen and I were using Sublime Text, basically, you know, very simple, lightweight text editor with some with some nice, you know, syntax highlighting tools to develop our app. But the Node.js tools for Visual Studio are also incredibly nice, and you can download them here at just nodejstools.codeplex.com. So uh, with it's, it's open source, right? Yeah, it's open source. It's extension. Yes, the extension. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know what you meant for a second. Yeah, but it's it's a really great and quite powerful Node.js IDE. It has um, it has IntelliSense features for you, which is like really great to work with when you're doing Node.js, and you can even add you know, breakpoints and things like that. And it just makes for pretty wonderful and easy debugging. Yeah, the debugging experience is a little better there because you can actually just put a, a breakpoint. The only way to do debugging, um, well, the, the easiest way without Visual Studio really is to download Node Inspector and then run a Chrome debugger on the Node yeah. Inspector client. It, it's actually not that really good of an experience, but um, VS does bring that together, which is quite nice. Yeah, so I definitely recommend checking that out, especially if you're already a Visual Studio user. Um, any other things that... Um, that I can think of. Uh, there's a couple of things you. Uh, so npm js like we uh, node like node package manager, which is like I hang out there all the time. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of cool packages that just come through. Um, a couple of things that you might want to look into are like, um, for example, and you could just like browse npm js uh, dot org and go through a bunch of things. But a couple that you might want to look into. One of the things are is like um, uh, what is it? Grunt. Yeah, Grunt, which is great for a task runner. So if you want to run your test, or say that you want to um, lint your, J your JavaScript uh, on your server or on your on your front end with like, hey, I want to make sure I didn't drop a, col a, a semicolon, or I want to make sure I didn't do a couple of things, it'll do that, and it can actually watch those things. Uh, other things are like uh, Mocha, which is um, my, my favorite unit test framework for, for Node. There's a few, but um, this one's like one of the most popular ones. Uh, there's also like Protractor, which I believe just comes with uh, um, it just comes with a. Uh, where does where do you find Protractor from? Uh, you, is it Bower or npm or? Um, I so you can get it just like along with Angular. Yeah. Um, and you can also it here. So Protractor, I think we touched about on it briefly before. It's basically a like really great test suite for especially for that front end Angular piece. Yeah. So you can you know run tests to make sure that your code is displaying exactly how you want it to or fits within a certain pattern. So I mean. We just wanted to bring you guys a lot of resources that'll help you go 
beyond just this simple jump start. Because at the end of the day, we, you know, we created a simple application that doesn't really do any of that testing piece or any heavy lifting. But if you do want to build a robust application on the mean stack, you definitely can. And there are a lot of resources out there for you, whether it's you know, scaffolding out an application or testing frameworks yeah. um, or you know, host entire VMs that you can use. I mean, we blew through about four or five huge concepts. So we did data binding on the front end, as well as uh, partials, uh, directives, and even talk about custom directives in Angular. Um, you have things on the back end like middleware for Express, um, node packages, um, doing, um, doing authentication, and we did, we did um, how to uh, apply routers and how to apply middleware to certain APIs, but not others. And on the front end, again, we, we bounded everything up together. We deployed it to the cloud. But we also had a, a few other MVAs. So this MVA is kind of like a capstone or maybe a, a precursor to a lot of other MVAs that we have that relate to the mean stack. So we have MongoDB MVA, which I did with Rami. Um, Stacy and Rami as well did the um, node. Yeah, the node. They did the node and Express one. Did mm -hmm. that one cover Angular? No, but Stacy uh, did a separate one with Christopher that covered Angular more specifically. Great, and then they have an Angular one too. So we we really have um, specific MVAs which kind of go deeper on each of these stacks. Um, for example, with Mo MongoDB, we never even talked about embedded documents or any of those things, which are really some of the big features of Mongo. Um, just because uh, this is there's so many concepts coming together, we don't want to overwhelm. But uh, if you're more interested in getting um, into more complex things to create really awesome mean applications, um, we totally recommend checking those out, um, as well as all the resources that we placed on the slides. So I think we've uh, talked our way out of um, um, Basically, everything, we have the app running. Everybody's kind of happy. We're, t we're cheaping along. Um, and unless you have anything else, Helen, I think we could we can sign our guest out. Yeah. Thank you guys so much uh, for, for joining us all today. Yeah, thanks for thanks for signing on. And um, at the end of this, uh, at the end of this MVA, there's going to be a um, quick survey. So if you don't mind filling that out uh, to give us some feedback about our MVA and uh, myself and Helen uh, and how good of a job or how bad of a job we might have done. <laughs> Jk, no, but uh, um, yeah. So other than that, thanks for signing on. Thank you for joining us, and we really do appreciate for you guys watching. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Okay.